Welcome to episode 70, where Kev, James and returning guest Kate talk to Emma, our returning therapist from one of our most popular episodes previously. This time we discuss counselling, inner child, self-love, meditation and day-to-day challenges with OCD, anxiety and stress. But we do have fun along the way. We all really enjoyed this really interesting and informative chat. But if anything here strikes a chord with you, please do seek help, speak to someone, talk to a therapist or a friend. Uh, We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back. We have a special, I know I say we have a special episode, but this is genuinely special. We have two recurring guests. We have Emma and Kate, um, who are actually two of our top listened to and viewed episodes ever uh, separately. So we've got them together and it's going to be the most popular episode, hopefully. Um, We did an episode a little while back with Emma, who you guys will remember. We talked about therapy, counseling, that sort of thing. We talked about some serious issues. We'll have some fun today, but we'll also bring up some serious subjects as well. Um, and obviously Kate's just, we've just had a little intro where Kate's met Emma and she's been keen to meet her as well. Cause me and Kate have talked about Emma quite a bit because we, she really enjoyed your episode and your thoughts. And we just wonder before we even start, what is the reason that you got into the therapy and counseling? And then we'll take it from there. Amazing. Uh, well, thank you for having me on again. Really enjoyed our last conversation and I'm really glad to be back and to meet Kate. <laughs> um, so why did I get into therapy? I think I was always really interested in deeper meanings and deeper looks into conversation and our mental well-being since quite an early age. I remember being like 10 years old and thinking I was going to be a school counsellor when I grew up um, for a short period of time um and then throughout high school I was like the friend that would always like give advice on relationships and how to sort of empower yourself and that sort of thing um and it wasn't until I went through a toxic relationship and all of lockdown happened and I really lost myself and I was really quite broken during that time and I started And my first ever therapy session was a couple's therapy with my partner at the time. And then once we broke up, I went down the path of my own therapy and I just saw my life blossom in the most beautiful way and developing like a deep sense of self-love and yeah, just this empowerment within myself. Um, So since then, it's just been a wonderful journey. And at some stage I knew I wanted to become a therapist, but I always thought it would be later in my life, sort of a mid-career shift. And then one of my friends challenged me, why not do it right now? Why are you waiting? So last year I left my job in the corporate world. I went freelance and I started studying uh, psychotherapy. Um, So I'm on the journey to qualify myself at the moment. But it's, yeah, it's been a lot of little points throughout my life that have all led me quite naturally to to follow uh, more of a therapeutic career and path for myself. Amazing. And do you think everyone should do therapy or do you think it is for people who struggle uh, with any emotion or situation? Or do you think it's something that everyone should do once a, once in their life, even if they're, they think they're in a good place? Is there yeah. still benefits? Um, I think it would absolutely benefit everyone and anyone. And I'm a big advocate for for therapy um i think there's quite a big stigma around therapy should only be for desperate cases or if you have really big trauma then you know you should go to therapy and even still kind of a societal um prejudice against people go to therapy like oh like are you okay like you need therapy um but i think there's a really big shift in the generations and how they view therapy and it's what it is how i describe it to people it's like getting a massage but your massage is in your brain and it's helping you just live a more peaceful more integrated more authentic life and yeah I don't know who wouldn't benefit from that since we all carry some wounds from childhood no one has the perfect childhood and as adults we have the power to 
make our life what we want it to be. And I think therapy and having that unbiased person to talk with about anything going on in in your life is a real gift and privilege that we all can act well yeah we can access there are charities if you know you don't have the budget for it the NHS tries to supply it with some waiting um, times as we were talking about in the last chat we had Um, but yeah if anyone has access to it it is a wonderful investment in yourself and I guess I'm curious if you guys have come across therapy or like if it has played any role in your life or in, in your circles. Okay, who's gonna go first? Go to, go to Kate <laughs> first. Um yeah, I've I've been through therapy before. Um and I found it a very valuable experience. And I think what you're saying, Emma, about that having that person that's you go to your friends for advice, you go to your family for advice, but you never have kind of an entirely unbiased opinion, you never have someone who's completely outside of the situation. And I think, and obviously they're a professional and they're there to listen, but I think in the way that a therapy helps you reflect on yourself and your own thoughts, it sort of mirrors back to you, like the way that a therapist listens and helps you to sort of analyze and process your own thoughts. Because sometimes your mind can be so busy that you can't even really know your own perspective on something. So I think it's a, an important space where you can process things and you can, I mean, when do we give ourselves time to think? We don't, we're so busy in our lives. So it's even even giving yourself an hour permission to think about things we don't do, do we? We're so busy on our phones and our lives and things. Um, and I think it's valuable having that unbiased opinion and really getting to the root of you know, wh- why we have difficulties. Is there something in our subconscious? Is there something in the past? Is it ourselves holding us back? And I think um, having a space where we can be led to ask the right questions is really important. So for me, yeah, I have done therapy before and I found it very beneficial. But I do think it's very important, like, you know how you have a connection with a friend? um obviously a therapist isn't your friend they're a professional but I do think you have to have a connection I think you have to find the right person that works for your way of thinking and for yourself or I don't know if someone has a particular issue maybe they need a specialist in that area but I think that is very important to find the right person yeah I agree I I I often talk about it like dating like as you say it needs to kind of be like a friend or or how you would look for a partner that speaks the same kind of language as you. Um, and I know some people have said like, oh yeah, I tried therapy, but it did nothing. And I'm like, oh, but did you connect with your therapist? Was it the right therapist for you? So it's not quite as black and white as just, yes, I've tried it and it didn't work. It has to be the right kind for you. Or maybe that person didn't do it long enough to reach that point where they had to ask the right question and get to the right you know, root of, whatever the issue was yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think caveat all of our conversations today if there's any question that someone's not comfortable answering just say pass and we will skip past it because I think it's I think it's interesting to delve into things but if it's personal obviously do not feel obliged to answer it at all Mm -hmm. Um, obviously because it's a podcast that's going to be published I think yeah that's nice to have that yeah, yeah. So don't don't feel bad if 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 someone asks you a weird question and you go, I don't answer that. Just say pass on that one and move on. Um, because oh, I was going to ask mm-hmm. Kate and I thought it might be a bit too personal, but what was there a reason that you went right? I need to speak to a therapist, or is it just a door that was open that you decided to go? I'll give that a go. Um, I think it was a bit of both. I don't really want to go into the reason because it's sure. personal, so that's a pack. Yeah, yeah um but I was feeling like blocks in my life and I was thinking there's a reason why I'm not sort of I feel like I'm holding myself back um I'm not who I could be um and I think I heard you mention it before Emma that you also have ADHD Mm -hmm. um and being neurodivergent our minds are very busy um and sometimes I struggle to even know my own thoughts because I have so many thoughts going on my mind all at once. Um, so, so that can be kind of very useful tool to sort of put them in a straight line. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's as much as I want to say without delving into no, the, that's, 
That's yeah. cool. I mean, I've mm. I've never thought about it personally. James, have you ever even is it even cop, cropped up in your head? I don't know if it's different for men. Like James, have you ever even thought of it or considered Not it or done it? Therapy or counselling of any sort for any reason? Yeah, loads. Have you done it or just thought about it? No, I've done it loads. You've done it. Do you mm-hmm. mind talking about it? I, again, yeah, I think it. it runs the risk. Um, with any profession, there's good people and bad people at their job. Mm-hmm. I think it's not vetted enough. I also think a lot of people aren't necessarily qualified um, in some aspects. You get a lot of jack of all trades, a bit like a GP. Like a GP can't really do much actual medical stuff to you. They can send you to a hospital. Whereas there's some, if someone went to see someone and they kind of got a bit fobbed off, I think that would do more damage than, because they might be like, I'll never do it again. Where did you find this therapist or counsellor? Was it recommended by a GP or did you do any research? Yeah, it was NHS and it was the the NHS on. It's not their fault, but it's a very, very long waiting list. Like you could be up to a year waiting. Um, But there's different things. There's one called IAPS which I don't know if you're familiar, I-A-P-T-S, which is a bit of a flawed system, really. You kind of have a meeting every week that lasts about an hour, which isn't very long. Is it an hour? I think it might be 45 minutes, actually. And you spend the first 10, 15 minutes every week doing the same thing. You go through these questions. Um, so on a scale of not very often, all the time, have you felt... Duh, 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 duh. So that's 10 minutes of your time gone. Then you've got 30 minutes to read it. And, and at the end of it, they print some stuff off the internet and give it to you. It's like, what? Like, that's literally zero help. It's really bad. Um, Did you get any po- any positives from it, from that no. particular... Um, no. no. Um, the best talk I ever had was actually with a GP. Went to see him. And we just chatted for like an hour and a bit. She didn't rush me out. She cancelled appointments. I am just sat and chatted. And sometimes that's all you need, really. Someone's go. Someone isn't on the clock, should we say? But maybe that's also down to this connection thing. You know, finding that person you connect with. I think a lot. If you go to someone that's on the clock, and you have got that time, that's always in the back of your mind. You can never really get into something and start flowing because. When that clock goes, but see again, you, you have most, to start all over again the next week. Expect most, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Emma, but most serious therapists would have a longer time than that, unless it's the initial meeting to quantify what you need help with. Um, with therapy sessions, they tend to be sort of fifty minutes or fifty-five maximum because they will see, you know, clients back to back a lot of the time. So you don't get a full hour with therapy. How? Or, you know, some some must do longer, like an hour and a half, maybe two hours. However, I find that an hour slot or 50 minute slot is actually really helpful because you do go really deep. And there is a lot that is shifted within an hour when you're really talking about, you know, real stuff from childhood or from trauma, or whatever you want to talk about. So actually to carry on past an hour can sort of like the what is it, the returns diminish kind of thing? Um, I think an hour's long enough, but when you have to spend 25, 30 minutes at time filling out sheets and doing stuff like that, that time mm-hmm. gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And before you know it, it's 30 minutes, 25 minutes, and it's like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Kate said, it might be like the connection wasn't there or the person wasn't fully invested or... Mm-hmm. It sounds like your experience, like... I just want to call you Munden, but I'll call you James. <laughs> um, it like it just seems like you referred somewhere, but it wasn't mm-hmm. like the right match, and it was just like you were having to tick boxes for the sake of it. Is that what it felt like for you, or not really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, I actually helped myself at the end of the day. Yeah. Sat on the internet, watched a load of videos, read a load of material, listened to a load of podcasts, and I found that well more helpful. Just That's put my time into learning about it. Yeah. And there are also a lot of types of therapy. 
which is um, quite important to like understand and know about. There are sort of more prescriptive like solution based therapies like CBT. I don't know much about CBT, but it is a lot more structured. Um, there's um, transactional analysis, um, which looks at your relationships with people. Um, and the, the, the framework that I follow is person centered. And that's where the therapist sees you, the patient, as the expert of your life. So it's not like the therapist says, you should do this, or have you thought about this? Or they don't, they can't give you advice because what do they know about your life that you don't know yourself? So you're kind of in the driving seat as the patient. Um, but something I find really fascinating about stuff like counseling or it can be just anything similar to that is you really get out what you put in a lot of the time so I know sometimes people are a bit cautious trying out therapy and maybe don't bring as much to the table um and that I find yeah it doesn't help as much if you're not just fully like this is how I feel full stop um I, and kind I, of I, go from there I get what you're saying. I think it would be difficult. Again, I, I don't know if this is a male thing. I'm just thinking from my perspective. Um, not literally my perspective, but I think a lot of men as well, especially if you go into therapy, it's probably more embarrassing to say I need help for a man to do it. I don't know if I'm generalizing. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm, I'm sure loads of women feel the same as well. But I think definitely men probably have a bit more of a a shame or embarrassment about asking for help when you know they're conditioned to be whatever provider or whatever you, you kind of go back you know to the neanderthal brain type thing but i also think like a lot of men probably go and go and fix me and if you haven't fixed me in half an hour then you failed you know i'm not this is mm. nothing to do with james's comment that's a complete separate thing i get the feeling from what james mentioned that he was put with a job's body who just ticked boxes and wasn't really that bothered that seemed like what James's experience was, but I feel just to touch on that, that wasn't like a one off occasion. That was over the space of maybe four years. Oh wow. Oh, God. So it really wasn't useful, no. Many different things. And I think at the end the end game, there's only one solution, and that's you find a way to flick that switch in your brain. Whether well, that's someone else helping you get there, or you working out your own way. And I was quite lucky that I worked out my own way. Well isn't a you know, again, MO correct me like isn't that a lot of therapy is 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 the genius of it is that you technically although you have to do a lot and you have to know lots it's about pushing the right buttons to go to listen to the information and to question the correct way so they question themselves and better themselves because mm. you can't fix anyone can you but you can open the door that says look at that oh yeah that's that's why i'm doing this that's the positive thing in my life and follow that yeah i find that kind of similar to what Kate was saying that when you are so close to your problem like if you're living in your head right and you're so close to everything like swirling around you it can feel like a tornado at times other times it's calmer but it just kind of feels confusing going to therapy is having a professional hold up a giant mirror and say hey you're saying this this is what I'm hearing and for you to hear it said back in words that maybe are your own or sometimes they're paraphrased or there's metaphors makes you hear back your thoughts as if you're hearing them for the first time and then you can make a judgment based on that and based off oh that reminds me of something else and you can really feed off of someone reflecting back what they're hearing um, but it being done skillfully not how a friend would have loads of opinions of yeah, he's he's shit, and you're right for doing that. It's like a very unbiased, just mirror of you're saying this. It sounds really lonely, and if you're like, I've never thought of it being loneliness. Like, yeah, you know, whatever it is, it's super useful. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. <laughs> what would be your favorite thing to do in a therapy session, Emma? Like. If you are being the therapist and you had someone walk in, I'm not saying you'd get excited about different <laughs> <laughs> medical what issues. What problems do you have? <laughs> I love it when they're just about to kill themselves. That's the best. No. Yeah. Right. Sorry. That's an inappropriate joke. But like, do you enjoy the, 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 the trauma side in the sense that someone's coming in on death's door, like, I need help, otherwise I'm not long for this world? 
or do you generally prefer someone who's got something just like like I mentioned like um just certain certain other conditions that are more smaller and easier to combat you know whether it's a, a relationship issue or anything mm. to do with stress or anxiety smaller I mean they're all important but one you've got to help them stat quick or one that you can build on and grow that relationship um yeah it's an interesting question i've not thought of it in that way um, sorry i said it so crudely i didn't mean it <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm trying I've got to inject um, some yeah, levity in it into a, <laughs> a counseling set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um i i i would say that enjoyable isn't the right kind of way to frame that um obviously you're never going to enjoy someone suffering in front of you um it's also really interesting because in kind of applying for placements during my masters of studying this you work for two years in any given charity while you're training and the kind of specializations of charities that you can pick from are like bereavement um you know cancer support domestic violence drug addiction there's so many areas that you think like as a counselor like oh like that is heavy like people are going through some major suffering and you are there to help people um so it's certainly not an easy role to go into um i find i think in terms of your question of what do I find most enjoyable? Uh, most satisfying, most, uh, most satisfying. Word than enjoying. Yeah, yes, most satisfying. satisfying are moments when I can offer something back, reflect back something someone said, and for them to have this switch of, that's it, like, that's exactly it, that's what I've not been able to kind of like frame in my mind, and I'm quite a visual thinker, so, you know, if someone, you know, is telling me that, that, for example, their relationship with their family is very formal and their parents have given them like all the key things and like safety and, and, and a house and whatever opportunities, but there's not the warmth or there's not the emotional connection, then I could like reflect that back and use, you know, metaphors or images to kind of say like, yeah, the the framework is in there, like the foundations of the house and and you know those are in but you haven't got like the soft tapestry and you haven't got the warmth or, or the fireplace or whatever it is and they're like yeah that's it or just like those moments um I find really valuable in being able to empower someone to just see their life in a more kind of um clear way or something those are moments I really value um when when you're able as a therapist to read between the lines and pull something out that they're not deeming as important enough. Um, and also moments where you can empower people or, or be empowered as the person getting therapy. It's just yeah, I can't I can't stop raving about therapy, just having that moment to yourself, moment of reflection as Kate was saying, and just to hold your life as so important in a way that you know so busy in life doing things for the people being you know a, a good son husband father whatever for people that you, you can't really like hold your life as the main character it's yes yeah, it's, it's a great place for that but i want to come back to something you said kev about maybe there being a difference between men and women um with seeking help or, or speaking with other people. And I don't know if you have any more insight on that, but something that I think about and kind of in our last conversation, we talked about the privilege that men have in society. Um, but I find a real lacking in privilege is that men generally don't mm. talk about their feelings or don't talk about their struggles or their vulnerabilities with other guy friends in the same way that women do with their girlfriends um it's so I don't know if we have that as a privilege that, that we do more <laughs> yeah. yeah it's so valuable to just like connect heart and heart with with other people and find I'd that know, James I'd, I'd like to go to James like I I don't think 
back when we were 20s, right, we probably did struggle unless we were wasted. Then we'd be spilling the beans, having a cry chat at four o'clock in the morning, whatever, about something that really bothered you. I don't think it's as difficult these days, but maybe that's maturity, the fact I'm older. Kids, boys these days, maybe still have the ish, same issues, but I don't know. I, the, the privilege I feel at the moment is that I don't feel like... A, I mean, I think there's issues, but I don't think I've got an, any issues that warrant complaining about, if that makes sense. I mean, I probably do, but there's nothing that... Again, maybe I'm just masking the small things that are... Can I just say one thing that you should like see someone about? What? Blowing your cat's bum hole. What's wrong with that? She likes a little, <laughs> little bit of fuzzy... What do you do? She's... She... Oh, do you want to demonstrate, Kev? No, she's like sleeping there. Every... He... Emma, I... he blows into his cat's ass. Just a little... <laughs> he lifts it's... the tail. Oh, cool. <laughs> She's full, she's full of fur. She appreciates a bit of a draft every now and again. I think you should see someone about that. <laughs> I, I was going to say, before before we went down the fuzzy article part... Um, Sorry. <laughs> thanks, Kate. You invited me on here. What do you expect? <laughs> That's right. Um, I was going to say, the job of being a counsellor and a therapist, Emma, I think is a very strong choice because um, in my own personal... <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to be a vet. And then I found out, I worked at a vet, apart from the fact I didn't get the grades for it, so it wasn't really a choice I had. But if it was a choice, I realized that vets have got one of the, one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. Mm. And it's because you want to go and help animals what? and you love animals, but you end up either. killing animals all day long. Well, construction's number one. Uh, I'm saying one of the top. Of well, suicide? Construction has high suicide? Yeah. And, and veterinary. But it's it's because you got to want to you get the job because you want to help animals and you kill animals every day. That is your job as a vet. You're killing, putting animals down all the time. You're visiting farms, killing animals all the time. You're around horrible things all the time, and it's it's pretty depressing. Mm. After seven is years. Is there a high suicide day. rate in vets? I feel like I have to Google that. Yeah, check it out. It's true. It's true. Um, it must be heartbreaking. Yeah, like breaking the news to families that. Yeah, but just don't be a vet. Pets. Yeah, but it's seven years. It's more <laughs> medical training than a doctor. Like my mate was That's a like lifeguard. Saying, be depressed. My life. My mate was a lifeguard. The two times he needed to save someone's life, he had panic attacks. It's like mm, change yeah. job now. Yeah, but but that's it. So the point we're trying to make is that there's certain professions that you know being a doctor sounds great helping people, but you're seeing trauma. Like if you're in the like A mm. ward, for instance, you're seeing trauma. You're seeing the worst parts of humanity, like people being stabbed, shot crashes and then there's the other job of being a policeman that sounds like a good rewarding job but all you're seeing is idiots drunk people violence um abuse horrible horrible things that people shouldn't be aware of like it's it's disgusting what they have to go through and you're picking therapy and, and that is dentist also... dropped there as well huh? I yeah. shut off, but... <laughs> dentist what like oh i gave too many th- th- Fillings, just, I, I think, I think it's because they get the piss taken out of them because they're a doctor and they go, yeah, I'm a doctor. Now you're a dentist. Why is it dentist got, like, I just don't understand. So I shouldn't take the piss out of these things, but I'm just confused. We love dentists. But yeah, like, but yeah, everybody. counseling, I think it's the same thing because you want to help people. But mm. everyone that walks through your door, the majority could be like really depressed or have problems and you go home at the end of the night and you're going to be like, oh my God. Yeah, you know, and you're, I've, you're taking I've, a lot. I've heard as well from my tutors and, and my professors that there are occasions within the therapist life, I guess, or career, where you might have someone come in who maybe hits their partner or a paedophile or, or you know, like extreme cases. Oh, shit, but, I didn't think about that. You're dealing with the bad mm. people as well. Or also like, you know, people going through prison reform or whatever it is, like sometimes you, if you're going down that path of, of therapy, you get assigned people and to turn, to turn someone away because um, you can't deal with it, you can't handle it. It's like, there's actually someone who in some way is asking for help. They want to improve otherwise they wouldn't come to you right so it's a really tricky thing of like knowing your own boundaries because there are certain qualities that you need to be able to offer you can't be 
uh, you can't be yourself and ask for therapy from someone who is judging you or is seeing you through a kind of lens of, of you're not a good person, right? So there are three three core elements within person-centered therapy that the therapist needs to offer you, which is um, empathy. You need to be able to kind of put yourself in their world and see it from their perspective. Um, congruence. So your therapist has to be able to be transparent and trustworthy and genuine with you, not playing a role. And the last one is unconditional positive regard. So your therapist has to believe that you are doing the best you can in your circumstance. So there can't be any judgment or prejudice or keeping your own framework of how the world should be when dealing with someone. So that's difficult enough as it is. Like you said, when you said like the paedophile or uh, someone who's beaten their partner comes in, wants help. My first impression is like, like, I don't know, not not a nice one. But when you take a second step back, you go, shit, yeah, like you said, like they they want help. They can't be that bad. They've clearly got some sort of compulsive disorder or something along those lines that, or an immaturity that they lash out in the wrong way or do the wrong thing, and they're asking for help. So they should be given loads of help, and that's why we shouldn't the you know the police shouldn't be doing half of those jobs it should be you you should be going to crime scenes not not murder ones because that's that that nails in the coffin there but you know like good pun that wasn't deliberate (laughs) 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 but yeah someone's beating their wife and the police go in there heavy-handed and you know beat the guy up and put throw him into prison yeah he kind of deserves a little bit of that but it should be a therapist he sees not just go to straight to prison, you know, or go mm-hmm. to prison and have therapy. Yeah. I- yeah. It's a good point, Kev. If you look at the statistics of like a lot of people that offend in crime, a lot of them have been for abuse or addiction or, you know, they might be committing a crime or doing something that's not good, but they've often had a lot of trauma. And like maybe if our system showed them some compassion and some help, you know, maybe there wouldn't be so many of these situations because maybe maybe they just need a therapist (laughs) Mm. and the the therapy environment is so unlike any other environment that you're in because there really is no agenda it depending on which kind of therapy but if I can generalize being sitting with a therapist is sitting with someone on your side and you don't get that you know with friends and family they they care about certain things, whereas your therapist only cares for your well-being. So whether you have trauma, whether you have less trauma, because I think everyone has a bit of trauma, is just like can allowing yourself to be in an environment where you're safely held and you have someone actively wanting to understand you and to hear you out and to, you know, just want the best for you. Um, Sometimes and I think that's really special, though, like to be listened to with a totally unbiased opinion like out of the therapy space to find that is so hard because often people have even if they think they're unbiased they have some sort of agenda or some sort of opinion or um so i think that's something special about therapy can Mm -hmm. i ask you about edmr therapy i'm very interested about like do you know much about that i don't i have some friends who do it Mm. so i've only heard from them um it's that eye movement therapy isn't it so yeah i don't know much about i don't know if you know more about it kate but um what i've heard about it from my friends is it's there's this research into how your eyes move affects different parts of your brain so if you can process trauma whilst kind of rewiring your brain through these physical movements that affect your brain you can kind of dislodge um, stuck trauma or stuck emotions that you can't reprocess um, and it allows them to kind of flow more and I've heard really good stories of people who do this eye movement while talking about something really difficult and where they have triggers that are happening on a daily basis um, for example someone was telling me that um, they they had been run over and they had an, an accident on the road and that had happened close to where they live. And every time walking the dog, they would be re-triggered from this scene. 
and going to EMDR and talking about it whilst moving the eyes left to right or tapping can be another one. After, I think, one session with it, afterwards she was able to just walk down the street and not think twice past the spot where it happened. Um, so cool. That's what, so interesting. What is EDMR, just to be specific? Is it? I don't know what it stands for. Do you know, Emma? I don't. Oh, just, James, can you Google it? <laughs> uh, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. That's it. Oh, I just know I had some friends heal. that tried it, and they tried traditional therapy, and it they'd been in years and years of therapy, and they couldn't sort of get to the point, like the root of their difficulties or what was making them feel or what was their blockage. And then they tried this and it like, I had a few friends and it sort of unlocked something. And I, I'm just super fascinated by the science behind it. How, I just, yeah. Sorry. How our eye movements connect to our brain and all this is just, it's very interesting. I wonder how someone discovered that. It was like mm. someone in a lab just like looking around a lot. And then they're like, oh, <laughs> I, I, I just, I just read a paragraph because I don't know what you guys well, are talking about. Thanks. Well done, Thanks. Whole paragraph. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to Google some words like like and, um, but I just, <laughs> but I, I still don't really understand what it is. I mean, I get I understand what I'm reading, but it says it involves moving the eyes in a specific way while processing a memory. that can help reduce the power of emotionally charged memories and replace Funny, that's negative. Exactly what Emma just said. Yeah, but I, I think I was probably Googling while you were explaining, but I, could, I didn't get it before and I'll probably... Like, I think my friend who had it said it's a bit like, do you remember that first tennis game that was on a computer? Yeah. Where it was oh. like two lines oh. and it was like... Oh. Yeah. Oh. 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 Someone described me as a bit like that while you talk about... So, <laughs> but but maybe they're like really good at Pong. It. But what does it literally mean? Does it literally mean I was run over? Rather than talking to you, I go, I was run over and do Pong in my head. Like, what... I think, don't you just talk while you watch it? Or how does it work, Emma? You're the expert. Tell us. I have never done EMDR myself. (laughs) I can relay from friends and people I've spoken to that sometimes it's someone with a light and they're going like this. So instead of like talking directly to the therapist, you would say like, this happened. Okay. How did it make you feel? Or something. I don't want to like trance anyone (laughs) from doing it. Just go. You are feeling sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've also heard of people like we, um, they have um, uh, some kind of like balls in their hands or they tap. <laughs> I knew you were going to laugh. <laughs> I was like, how do I word this? So relax that way with that. <laughs> I'm signing up right now. Sorry. <laughs> past 30 minutes, people thought we had a serious podcast, but <laughs> then you're gone. You're gone. I'll come off it. We, we, I think we've done very well. Yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> Kate's been the most unruly one talking about fluffy arseholes. Oh, that's you, though. Sorry, go on. Wait, serious? Okay. You don't have to be serious <laughs> while I was talking about it. You all want to treat your cat like an ocarina. Yeah. <laughs> blowing up his ass. I don't know what an ocarina is, his but. mouth I'm opens it. goes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what an ocarina is. I don't know what an ocarina is. So uncultured. An organ, like um, a... Um... Yeah, it looked like a, almost like a conch sort of thing. Like a... <laughs> I looked at one. I still don't know what that is. Looks... looks like yeah, they don't always down... look that weird. Some of them Still's are like made out of like um, porcelain or something. There's a man blowing into one. Yeah, that's exactly what you do. Yeah, it's not the most masculine of instruments. He's pursing his lips right round the sphincter of the tool. Your cat is. I don't, I don't go that close to the, the cat. Is that what your cat, she was walking across your desk in your podcast. He's just like trying to get some. She walks one way and she comes back for another go. Yeah. She's going back and forth. Well, this is very weird. <laughs> like, careful the RSPCA, don't get involved, Ken. I'm not assaulting the cat. I'm giving her some like wind relief, like <laughs> breezy appetizers. <laughs> I think she's enjoying it way too much, and so are you. So yeah, I, I think you need therapy for this. <laughs> Apparently so. I, I was I was going to say as well. I sent it to Kate. She might not have listened to it because I only sent it the other day. Um, but you're on a podcast the other day called Help Is Here, which yeah. I had a good listen to that, and that was really enjoyable. And it was specifically, I know I know you deviated a bit, but it was specifically on compulsive behavior. That's his thing. Mm-hmm. And um, that that was quite interesting. And 
I think it made me think what things am I compulsive about and what are, I, I can't, there must be so many different things that people are compulsive about, but they can't all be negative. And it just depends on if that spills over and affects your day-to-day life, you know, like comp- mm. compulsively having a, you know, a drink on a Friday night or compulsively doing stuff. It can be, I mean, his compulsions, we won't go into that's, that's uh, mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Kev is more is personality traits, not, um, an illness. Yeah, uh, it was, it was, it was around addictions. So different types of addictions. Um, yeah. So I think when, because obviously last time we had this conversation, James, we were talking about OCD a little bit, mm. which I think is linked, but I, it's a separate, maybe it's not a separate thing, I don't know, but kind of the conversation I was having with that, he's a life coach that focuses on addiction. Um, it was talking about sort of how we don't realize we're doing certain things and part of it, is our body saying, oh no, you're starting to feel something. Let's press it down. Like, let's, let's do something like like that we habitually do. Um, But the fact is with an addiction, the more you want something, it's not adding anything positive to your life. It's keeping you stuck in a loop, which feels helpful in the short term because it keeps you from feeling something that's a bit uncomfortable. Um, But the outcome isn't, isn't helpful in your life um so that's why you kind of it's valuable to look at it and take it apart and see is this actually what you want to be doing and if it's not how can you take small steps to alleviate yourself from that habitual sort of mindless pattern and um, which keeps you stuck so has anyone here got any addictions or things they do compulsively that they're happy to share got a few but i don't want to share yet <laughs> james has got some i know he has Go yeah on. Well, i got ocd aren't i but is there yeah there's anything you want to share or anything you don't you don't have to obviously there's no yeah, pressure it's ridiculous like it, it's hilarious it's like it's such a ridiculous thing to have um like i'll have to like uh when i was little you used to like flick a light switch like four times it's just like <laughs> it's just stupid stuff that you know is stupid when you're doing it like when you know you're like you like oh um and why four times do you know why it's four does that does that does that resonate even numbers. Anything or... no. um oh i'm something I'm stupid. Same on you probably, if you watch me long enough for a day you'd notice loads of weird stuff like i have my desk and my window set up <laughs> exactly the same every single day because if i don't something really bad's gonna happen even though i know it's not but i'm like well well if it does you know, don't be stupid, of course it's not. You're like, and you have an argument with yourself. So it's easy just to put it back where it was. <laughs> it's just stupid. And that's crossing it's... the border into like superstition a little bit, potentially. No, as it's well. nothing to do with that at all. You know, it's ridiculous. It's just like, imagine you were walking around and someone was walking around with you with a gun to your head all day long. But the thing wasn't pulled back. And then you'll like knock a door, like you'll just like brush against the table and you'll be like, you hear that? Like, okay, well, now I've got to do it again. And you're like, well, he's not going to shoot me, obviously, but what if he does shoot me? Oh, just easy just go and do it again. Like, mm. if I scuff my shoe when I'm walking, I have to do it like three more times. Or it would stress me out. And, that, like, and, what, and I'll be like, something bad's going to happen. Is that OCD? Is that classed as OCD? Yeah, yeah it's obsessions and get, compulsions. Like, just like that. Like, when I'm walking along, I'll see a certain paved stone and I have to stand on it. And then I walk past it. And if I, like, if I haven't stood in it or a particular leaf, I'll feel like, oh my God, something bad's going to happen. I'll go back and walk and stand on that leaf. Yeah, I'm but like to, to the it. point where if I don't do it, someone's going to die. Oh. Mm. Yeah, that's like, it. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Even you're like, no, it's stupid. It's like, what if someone has a car crash later? Even though you'll forget that mm. thing by that time, you'll be like, well, then that's going to happen. But it's obviously not. But what if it does? It's because I haven't done that. So I just go and do it. But mm. what does it mean for like, I was going to say normal people. I, that sounds terrible, but oh, it's got, mental. It is like a mental. OCD, <laughs> it's right? ridiculous. Yeah, you've got OCD, so you feel like something bad's going to happen. But like Kate mentioned, I do that all the time. Like light switch, 
I don't do a light switch. I remember doing that when I was younger, but just normal things. It has to be even numbers. I can't do it out of sync, but you don't, it's not like a compulsion. I don't think it's like a minor one, but like, like Kate said, when you walk on the street, if my, if I, if I'm not paying attention to the floor, I'm just walking. But if I glance down the floor, my foot lands on a line, then the next one has to land on a line. Yeah, I think the difference is consequence. Yeah, I don't like consequence. It's just annoying. It just grates yeah, on Yeah, it's like, you know, when people put their pens in order. That's just because they like having yeah. their pens in order. Or if someone likes to be clean, they just like to be clean. Whereas mine's all ridiculous stuff. Like I'll um, just try and think. Well, I took my hat off twice at the beginning of this podcast. So, oh. like, like, if I adjust my necklaces, I'll do it twice. Hmm. But like, if I so, don't, I'll have, like, an anxiety attack. So is is a big part of your day kind of living from this fear of something no, no, no. might happen? Pure, no, no, it's, it's split. It's, it's very short bursts. Hmm. So do I could go a whole day cup? and is not like- really do much. Yeah. Or I can, if I'm out and about, if I'm, if my mind's completely occupied with something, I'll like, maybe not notice it. But if I'm out and say, I don't know, just walk into the shops and I'll like scuff my foot, I'll be like, well, I'll have to do it again. I'll have to do it like four times. If I think I might have only done it three, I'll be like, okay, well, now I have to do it again, four, because it has to be right, because it's not yeah. right. I used to do it brushing my teeth when I was younger, but I don't do that anymore. I think with age and with... I noticed it when I was about 10. So with age, I've learned to kind of almost laugh at it to myself. I wouldn't laugh at someone else's, but I can laugh at it to myself because I know it's ridiculous. So I'm like, mm. what are you doing? And then, um, yeah, you kind of just deal with it. Sometimes it can be quite annoying. Like, if you go into Lou in the middle of the night and, like, you shut the door... Then you have to like double check it shut like four times. And you get back into bed and be like, Well, I didn't was it four? Did I do three? I have to get out again. I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> so it can be Sounds exhausting. frustrating at times, I guess. It can be a bit exhausting, not really exhausting, just like irritating. But um yeah, it's just one of them things you just go on with, I think. And how yeah, line's not that? extreme, but I don't have to like mm. scrub my hands like every time like, like ten times or like cause any damage to myself. Mine's just like little throwaway things. Mm. Do and you I, think I, I, that's I, that's I, into your day, kind of like because you're so used to it. Like Yeah, it's just part of the day. Yeah. Like someone proper looks at me every single day, notice me. They like notice me doing loads of like stupid things. Like I'll shut my drawer twice or something stupid like that. But it's little things. They're so quick. It's not like I have to spend half an hour doing it at a time. It's like a few seconds at a time. But sometimes you can kind of like go fight over it. But which is, which is you know, easier now, I think. But sometimes it's easy just to give in to it and just do it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, just do it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I see it as more of like a stupid thing now. It's why I tell some people about it. I don't tell a lot of people because... The normal reaction you get is, oh, yeah, I got that. It's like, great, brilliant, yeah, cool, whatever. Um, which is why I think it takes, I think I read it, I read a lot of stuff about it. I think it takes on average someone 10 years to admit they've got it. Oh. But then, like, apparently, like, you're like 10 times more likely to commit suicide, which is crazy. I don't mm. know how that works, but um, I think it's like 2% of the population have it, one and like half of that have it, like, bad. Mm. I don't know if mine's bad or not, to be fair. You see, like, the problem is with it, it's kind of, like, mocked, openly mocked, and it's really, like, friends mocked it for years. It's in they loads of TV shows. They made a joke out of it with Monica, didn't they? Yeah, but it's in loads of TV shows. But, but yeah. Most, but most things are, whether it's ADH or, or um, OCD or anything like that, everything's mocked in comedies and, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is what I think is poor things. media representation. Very poor media representation. Whenever you watch, like... A program about it it's always just someone cleaning the house all the time mm-hmm. it's like what's well, not really what it is and it makes it look like it's just constantly cleaning or something stupid mm-hmm. yeah because some you... people even think it's called obsessive cleaning disorder it's a real misunderstanding <laughs> isn't it of like what what how hard it really is to live and how much it can affect you and... it can affect you at times i mean not anymore it doesn't really bother me i've got other things to worry about but um yeah, I imagine some people it can be really bad. Like then people that have to like constantly wash everything, have like the germophobia, 
kind of side of it. That must be annoying. Like going out in restaurants and pubs and not being able to like use cutlery and things, but I'm not bothered by that sort of stuff. Mine's just stupid little things like I'll knock my hand against the table and I have to go and do it again or something stupid. Mm. You would definitely notice it if you followed me around all day, but it's not really anything crazy. It's look just look a bit weird sometimes. Can I um s- um offer something? Is that I notice you calling it stupid and ridiculous a lot of times. And I wonder if you've um, learned uh, or investigated much about in a in a child work. Have you come across that? No, I mean I wouldn't call anyone else's that. It's just how I deal with mine. Mm. Like if someone said I've got OCD, I'd be like, oh shit, tell me about it. I wouldn't be like, that's stupid. I'd be like, that's just how I see mine because I just like it is just throw away things. Yeah. So I can um, laugh about it now. Like it's like. Eh. But it sounds but like got... it's quite an inner conflict of like you and these, as you call them, stupid or ridiculous things you have to do. It's like you against that and you have to kind of like shut them down or you just, they make you do these things. And is that how you yeah, see it? I mean, end of the day, I've got other things to deal with that are more important than that. So it kind of falls down the pecking order. <laughs> it's mm. my daily, my daily things I deal with. But, but every, um, everything's important, you know. Mm-hmm. Ah, some yeah. more important than others. But those right, I find it interesting things. how we have these things that I think most people have things that affect us, you know, nowadays as adults that started when we were young in very formative years, um, you know, whether it's 10 or whether, you know, it's they say um, between three and eight are disproportionate years as to how much what happens in those years affects the rest of your life. Um, yeah. And so in a child work, is kind of holding that younger you who was so fresh and wide-eyed to the world and, you know, felt joy and laughter and play very important and also felt really strongly pain and hurt and disappointment in our caretakers or in in people in our lives. And those don't kind of vanish as we grow older. There is still that 10-year-old or 8-year-old living inside of us And so doing inner child work is just holding this part of yourself that still gets triggered, still feels things really deeply, but it's forming a relationship and an open dialogue and kind of just being curious into more of our emotions. Um, And I find it's, it's really common for people to say that's, that's a stupid part of myself. Like, how silly am I kind of thing, but actually to hold it and say, you know, these things, whether it's the light switch that you're talking about, James, or or anything else, there is a point in your life where that actually kept you safe and that kept, you know, a feeling of control or that you were actively helping people. It just made you feel good in some way. So there's also a part where it's like, you might think it's stupid now, but for 10-year-old you, that was a really helpful coping mechanism for what was happening around you maybe. Um, And I don't know much about OCD specifically, but that's how I sort of approach things within myself of, you know, if I get triggered and I'm like, why the hell is this still triggering me? Like, I should just be able to move past it. But actually, you know, eight-year-old Emma really struggled when that was going on and I need to hold a safe space for that within me. Um, And that really helped me. I don't know if any of you three have sort of a relationship with your inner child. I think that's a really good point. And I think it's really nice to think about that and and maybe like you're making a very good point about like maybe you develop those habits maybe not speak about London specifically it's not like a OCD thing it's not a conversation about any like habit or um difficulty you have but like whatever habit we develop that can be challenging um you make a good point about like maybe you needed it at that time in your life and that's where it developed but my question is like how do you go back to your childhood self like can you even remember like how how does that even work because you say it's valuable to go back to that time and that person but like who can remember so how can you even revisit that like it's i can remember like it's yesterday from pretty much but i struggle to remember like so i did loads of for revisiting that emma like for how do you explore i mean obviously therapy but like yeah, I, I it's it's a really common uh, res- trauma response 
to completely blank out years and years of our childhood. And like, this is something that I still struggle with, like new memories come up sometimes. I'm like, oh yeah, that happened. I've completely forgot that. So there is a way to reconnect with your younger self and memories. Um, but I think it's a relationship, kind of how there's the relationship between you and your therapist. There needs to be a relationship with you and yourself. So um, things that have sort of helped me track back to that is firstly just creating space in my day. So not being busy all the time, otherwise you just can't, don't have the mental space to to explore that. Um, but creating sort of like a, an evening for yourself with no phone around, nothing to do. And I like meditation. <laughs> If you don't like meditation, there are other ways to be with yourself and to start creating a safe space within your heart and your mind. Um, journaling really helps to get your thoughts out on paper and just see where your pen takes you. Um, that's another way. But I think just creating a trust within yourself that they, they, there's an interesting saying that memories come up when they feel safe enough to come up because they know that you can hold them right? And they're not going to send you spiraling. So if you start meditating, for example, and a lot of like scary things start coming up, they're only coming up because they know you can handle it. And that is the healing process. Um, so that, that way. Yeah. What's that? Sorry. I said that's super interesting. I never thought of it that way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I think lots of people try meditating and, and say, oh, that's awful. Like scary things came up. I don't want to go there again. But that's how you're kind of like releasing them is through feeling them. If we never feel anything painful, if they're just getting suppressed and they the, then they become repressed and they show up in as different symptoms in our life. But there's a real power in saying to yourself, I am not scared to feel anything because I know it's just a physical feeling in my body. And like, if it feels scary... Your, it's your mind trying to come up with reasons as to why you're feeling this way, what this means, where it came from, what it's going to mean. But that's your brain running away with thoughts. If you just feel the anxiety in your body or, or depression or uh, sadness or anger, if you just feel it in your body, what you'll notice if you can let go of the thought is it feels like tingling in my chest or it feels like my throat's a bit constricted or my hands feel tingly or I feel full of energy. If you can stay with, it's this tingling in my chest and not run away with thought, then you can absolutely hold it because it's just a tingling in your chest and it's not going to make you do anything stupid or reckless. It's just a feeling in your body. And that is what meditation allows you to do is let go of that it's because this person said this and that happened and oh my god someone did something awful to me and that like that's just the thought your body is feeling what it's feeling and it needs to feel it in order to to release it and, and let it go i feel like people listening to this podcast because emma's got such a, a lovely soothing voice that i think everyone in my imagination is listening to this looking like kate like on a comfy sofa cuddling a pillow <laughs> that's how i imagine everyone like listening to this episode <laughs> well sorry what were you gonna say Kate? i said i'm very comfy on my sofa <laughs> yeah yeah you look it and i need to um apologize because i get really passionate about this so i can like oh, run away with thoughts um and i kind of feel like i'm out of touch with like how the average person looks at their trauma or how the average person has a relationship with their body and their inner child and things because this is my world this is like my playground I love this stuff there isn't a single like pebble that I leave unturned in my mind I'm just so curious over everything that's happened to me and how I frame everything in the world um whereas I know you know it can be a really scary place for people so I think I'm maybe like out of touch over what is obvious that everyone knows and what is like a new concept for people um i think it can be scary for most people the, the idea of exploring you know if, if it's i don't know depression okay you might want to come closer to your mic oh, am i too far away now am i comfy so yeah. <laughs> too comfy <laughs> <laughs> you're really comfy then 
For the listener, she's on a horizontal about 12 foot away from her mic. Oh, I didn't think about that. I'm, I'm on a like really crap laptop as well. So sorry, work. It's a work laptop. Um, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. No. Hello. Good. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I think the idea of exploring, I don't know, your unconscious or the reasons behind and things, can be scary really scary for most people because you're really confronting you know difficulties i think that idea like if it's depression you want to know why for example really going to the root of it is terrifying rather than just like just getting on with your daily life and like oh i feel depressed is almost easier than i think finding out the reasons why because when you confront these things they can be a bit like shocking or a bit I don't know, reality, reality checks can be difficult. Mm -hmm. I think just, just living sometimes is, is hard work. When you start to calculate all the responsibilities of being an adult and all the things you've got to go through, it can sometimes be a bit overwhelming when you take a step back because you just do it. You just go to work, you do all the things, you pay for the stuff. And then if you actually take stock of what you're doing, it can freak you out. Like if you lose your job for one month, like even people that are very well paid, you're only a, a few months away from being on the streets if you if things fuck up, you know. So it's it's quite overwhelming the sort of lack of control you have of your life sometimes. So yeah, I, I was going to say, Emma, is there? Would you say that? Or I don't know. Alternative therapies is not what I want to say, but personal therapies like things that you think you do to therapize yourself do you think that is bullshit do you think it's valid or do you think it's just pretending like for instance obviously i don't do therapy um i don't have any major things in my life that would say again i we talked about it last time i had a depressive moment during lockdown but you know who didn't other than that i'm I think I'm on an even keel most of the time, but I do have certain oh. things that bother me and I don't like getting them out. And I go to heavy metal rock, violent gigs and go into the pit and you kind of, I don't hit anyone well, very rarely, but um, you get it out in that sort of aggressive, like they always say that metal heads are the most mentally stable of all people that listen to music which doesn't make sense if you're not a metalhead but if you think about it if you're listening to like like these two get it emma you, you don't listen to heavy stuff you know but if you listen to heavy stuff that's like yeah it gets all that aggression out and then when the music stops you're like you feel washed over with like happiness and euphoria and you feel cool mm -hmm. and most metalheads i know are really chilled outside of listening to metal if that makes sense mm -hmm. so is it almost um i guess anything in the arts can really bring emotions like strong emotions and you know whether it's music or films they take you on an emotional journey and i wonder if these are kind of states of being and emotions that you don't allow yourself or and you don't end up feeling on a day-to-day -day basis because everything is okay for the most part right we we go to our job we whatever we uh, um, meet friends for a drink and go shopping or whatever it is i think we we're on a pursuit to feel good to feel okay just constantly and to have something creative in the arts music um art or films or whatever it is they evoke other kinds of feelings within us is is that kind of what you think metal music does for you is it brings through a rush of energy and anger and release that you don't otherwise well, find it, in other places well yeah you can't really go crazy at someone because they've frustrated you in real life you just go right just just a dickhead i'm just gonna forget about that otherwise things you know you, you don't want those sort of emotions to escalate but you go to a pit and even if there's not literal aggression there it's just the shoving and the pushing the bouncing the fun and jolliness that's the weird thing is everyone thinks that these things are just full of people punching each other they're not 
um, that's a very minor, minor part and only occasionally happens. It's usually a very helpful crowd and you feel it's the only time in my life where I feel like fully inclusive. Like mm. if you go to Reading Festival, you don't feel inclusive because it's hip hop people with pop people with rock people and it's all different walks of life and you do get aggro. You go to Download Festival where everyone is wearing black and all there for head banging. There's like a sense of community that you don't get. Like I was saying to James last week when we had our other guest on, uh, Eleanor, and I just made a silly joke. I, I, I said something and James took the piss, rightly so, because I sounded like an old man. I said, I don't want to go out with my, I, I, I want to go out with my colleagues at Christmas, but it's to a place where they're going to be playing like ooh, ooh, music and, and I have to go along to like be part of that. And no matter what, even if I try to enjoy it, it grates on me that I have to do it. If I went to a little pub where they had jukebox with some Beatles or rock and roll, I'm in my element. I can be chilled. But in an environment I'm not keen on, it, it angers me and annoys me and, it, mm. and I, I feel uncomfortable and I can't relax. So, yeah, being in those sort of environments, a community, it's yeah. a really empowering thing, I think. Yeah, and a place where you have chosen and you belong. It's like finding your people and people you can relate to, I think, is really important. And I love what you're saying about bouncing around and like being, what do you say, being jolly and like having fun with people. It sounds like, a, in. I hope you don't take offense because it's not meant with any offense, but it's like a child playing and finding joy in this like lighthearted spirit. So I wonder if it's also part of it is you're in a child is, is being able, be able to like come out and play and like just have fun. Well, well me, me and Kate, well, me and James have been to gigs as well, but me and Kate, when we were younger, me and Kate used to go to dozens of gigs, like like one a week in London, Southampton, Portsmouth, all these places. And me and Kate would go to gigs that were, from the outside perspective, brutal, extreme, like, and look at her face. Look at her face right now. I can't imagine Kate going there. Just, I don't look like your typical metal chick, do I? We just, we, just I bounced around. we just bounced around and had fun and you bumped into people and people went, hello. And you'd end up, you, you made friends. You'd have friends for life that you just met at a gig. My my uh, One of my best mates in Chester, uh, recently single, went to a gig and ended up bouncing into a girl in the pit and got her number. And they've been in like a, a relationship for the past five months. Like, no a really good bounce. <laughs> he, he's one of the best bouncers they around. Him just the right way. <laughs> he's yeah. So so yeah. Like I think that's that feels like therapy. But is that just me hiding? Like, should I? Should there be a therapy? Mm. Because that's the only way I c I feel I can get it. Or is that cool? Just to that's your thing. Do your thing. The thing is. Going to therapy or really doing anything in life needs to come from you wanting to do it and you seeing like there is a need for it, right? If anyone says to you like, you need therapy, drop what you're doing, go, and you don't want to, you're not going to put in your all and you're not going to get out the maximum of it. Um, so definitely people finding a release and enjoyment in life, a hundred percent, like keep doing that, keep finding enjoyment. Life is about enjoying yourself, having fun, finding meaning, um, however you feel is best for you. So I don't think there's a pres prescriptive um, reason to, to go to therapy. I, I do think for you or for anyone listening to this, if there are elements of your life that you are scared to tiptoe into, or if you find that maybe you're feeling stuck in life, or you're maybe just feeling like you're plateauing, there's elements that you're a bit unsatisfied with, you feel like you can get more out of life than you currently are, whatever you're feeling lonely, there's a relationship, whether it's a family one, a friend or a romantic partner that you can't see eye to eye and you're feeling like you have to suppress your needs to please everyone around you or if everyone around you, you need to help and you can't stop helping people and there's no time for you. There are so many reasons why you might be unsatisfied with your life. And if you want to change that, if you want to regain control of your life, then 
that's where I would suggest that it could be great to talk to someone about it to sort of see what is going on behind that um, and to explore that more so you can change things because until you know what the ingredients to a certain thing are then you're going in blind and you're trying different things but just to have a safe space with someone curious about what is your your individual experience someone who values your yeah your life your experience your happiness um your range of feelings um that can be a really safe space to explore them in and i know in my experience it has made the world of a difference because i was completely lost i was hanging out with a lot of people who i didn't feel like i belonged with you know you gave the example of going to a christmas party with work and like feeling like you have to fit in with people just to hang out but you feel uncomfortable and like I don't know, for me, I, I would tell my therapist, it feels like I'm walking against um, a stream, just like I'm on my own. I'm just trying to make things work. I'm trying to be happy and I just can't quite crack it. Um, yeah, it's completely changed my life in that way. So that's what I would say. You like everyone is free to make the most of their life in any way they want. But if there's a part that you are trying to fix yourself and you can't quite work past it, then I would recommend seeking out someone, trying out a few people, trying out a few different approaches to therapy, um, seeing what resonates the most with you. Um, and another thing that I would really encourage people to do is to build a personal relationship with yourself. So self-love is quite a hard thing that, you know, the term is thrown around a lot, self-love, self-worth. It's like, what does that mean? It can feel unattainable if, you know, if you feel really far away from it. Um, so start to not with... to interject a joke there, but James is good at self-love. Okay. Without without the uh, masturbation jokes, which are clearly on the <laughs> Sorry, table. Sorry. I so didn't even funny. think of that. <laughs> you didn't ask a serious question. Oh, struggle. Because obviously we have to go there. But um, how do you truly love yourself? Great question. I just look in the mirror, okay? King. <laughs> Fucking gorgeous. <laughs> That's actually a good question. Got a VCR tape like they're set up recording himself as well. <laughs> I just think you've got to appreciate what you're capable of. Mm. Like what you're actually capable of, not what you're currently doing. Because you might never do what you're capable of. Like whether it be a skill, picking up an instrument, making someone's day. I don't know. But when you appreciate the reasons of why your friends are your friends, they can see it. Mm. So, so I'm going to be super passive. Unless you've got no friends, in which case, well, sorry, <laughs> LOL. I don't know. I've got no friends. I struggle to like being really personal here. I struggle to love myself and I struggle to see what other people say they see in me. And so maybe I do need more therapy, like reflect back. People say really lovely compliments to me and I can never see them. So how do you find, how do you get to that like truth of what's there if you can't see it? Like, how do you get past that? I think it's, um, I don't, I can't tell you the answer to that, but I think part, the, the start of the journey is knowing that it's a journey and it's not a quick fix. It's like you're, you're the only person who, um, you know, you wake up to uh, every day of your life and you're the most important relationship that you'll ever have in in your life and it's almost like if if you've been well married for 20 years say but you spend no time with your partner you're like oh why don't you love me or like if if you like put your partner down all your life with like insults and you're not good enough and why can't you be like everyone else and then you're like oh why don't you love me it's like there's a lot of retraining our habitual patterns um how what how much we think we're capable of holding. Um, and I think growing more of a curiosity into ourselves. I've heard a really beautiful saying when it comes to sort of romantic relationships that um, as soon as you're, you're with your partner and you feel like you know them fully, 
you can't love them anymore. You stop loving them if you're no longer curious about them and you want to learn more about them. Um, so I think, yeah, attention is love. And the more we can just spend time with ourselves, I think that's a really great starting point to rebuild a healthy connection um, and view of ourselves. And I love what you said about people can pay you compliments but they're really hard to accept. I think that's just another thing we have to learn is I heard someone say that a compliment is a gift and to turn it away is like someone giving you a physical gift and you saying, no, thank you. Like keep that to yourself. It's in a way like it doesn't belong to you. It's given to you. Um, so I have some of my friends who I'll tell them a compliment and I'll be like, oh, what are you talking about? Or it's quite common with uh, women that you say, oh, I love what you're wearing. They're like, oh, this whole thing, oh, it's really cheap. Or you go into sort of explaining things away. And I've been training my friends that when I give you a compliment, all you have to do is you have to stop and say, thank you. That makes me feel X. So that makes me feel happy. <laughs> I saw you, Kev. <laughs> um, I think I think James is onto something though. Like finding out, like yeah, he made a good point about like you might have a gift, you might not always use it to its full potential because I don't know life. But like finding out what makes you special. Why are your friends friends with you? You know, is it because you blow cats' bun holes? <laughs> Maybe that's why. It's just Kev. You did it again. <laughs> Sorry, the the opportunity presented itself. <laughs> I was going to say one thing about what you mentioned, and pe you might have heard this before because it's in a, in a film and it's probably something famous that the film used. And I loved it. I remember hearing it. and I can't remember the film. It's going to annoy me. I think it's a comedy. So it's not meant to be taken seriously until this moment happens. And you go, oh, my God, that's deep for like a silly comedy and it's a it's a guy taking a piss out of himself going oh you fucking idiot why'd you do that you oh i can't believe i did that i'm such an idiot and then his friend goes oi don't you dare speak to my friend like that i was like i love that oh shit that's it's not meant to be as deep as it was <laughs> yeah, but in a way in a way <laughs> that was good wasn't it i was just like oh shit that's great and what I find heartbreaking about what Kate just said is that I can't imagine, I don't know why you wouldn't have that relationship with yourself because all that stuff that people tell you why they like you, it's, it's true. You know, I, I've never met anyone in my life that doesn't like you. Like oh, you are one of the most likable humans on earth, but James is nodding there. You are, you are. Not <laughs> He's talking about you. <laughs> you're hilarious, you're Horrible fun, thing, me. and you're just like the nicest person. So there isn't anything negative that you should take away from yourself. And if I'm bad at taking compliments though, but I get like yeah. backhanded with them. Like someone be like, nice shirt, and be like, yeah, well, yeah, I know, that's why I bought it. Like <laughs> It's like using humour to deflect when we're uncomfortable, because I do the same thing, James. I do it all the yeah. time. Like, yeah, I do have um major imposter syndrome though. And like at work it's really like held me back. Like really, really held me back. So I don't really if I can do something, I'm kinda of like, well if I can do it, it's not really that hard. So it's like mm. and it kinda of like stops me from doing things while I stop doing photography, it stops like while I stop painting. Cause I was like, eh. It's not that good really, is it? So just kind of but, give like, up. With art, it's all subjective anyway, but we do it to ourselves and it stops us like yeah, I, I, always, I, I say it all the time to people at work. I'm like, look, nothing's that hard. Look, if I can do it, it's not hard. And it's like, well... Mm. Yeah, but it's comparing <laughs> yourself. There's always someone better than you, but there's always someone worse than you. No. So... Do you know what I noticed about like living abroad, where like obviously I'm mixed with people from lots of different cultures? Our tendency to put ourselves down is cultural. It's very mm. British thing. Um, and it's we it's part of our sense of humor it's like in english culture like when you're talking about like when you compliment a friend on a dress it's almost a competition to be like well i bought mine from a charity shop well i bought mine from primark and you have to be kind of proud that you didn't like almost make an effort and like the more you can put yourself down it's like and in i'm, I'm realizing like it's interesting sometimes like finding that perspective of living abroad for a long time of like seeing my culture from the outside sometimes that i thought was just sometimes me but then i realized oh it's actually quite a british thing 
that mm-hmm. um we don't like to take a compliment and we like I kind of we we use humor a lot we we are quite like sarcastic but we also um I don't know we don't like to be proud of ourselves in a way and I think I'm proud of myself I just worked out something well done oh I can charge my if I plug my iPhone into my iPad it charges it up Good job. It's only well, taken you 70 episodes. That's Shut not that hard. the fuck up, Kev, and stop putting me down. <laughs> <laughs> You're useless. Stop. Fair enough. Kev, how many times have you blown your cat's bum in this episode? He's got a calendar. <laughs> like a little tick sheet. There you go. <laughs> it says, medium blow, no response. <laughs> Mild blow. Medium per. <laughs> he rates them. <laughs> yeah. He's doing, doing a, a therapy science experiment. There. If it's long and persistent, she doesn't move. She just lets it ride. <laughs> she just sat there on the floor looking at me. <laughs> Probably thinking, is he going to do it again? <laughs> I feel like I've learned a lot about you, Kev, from this episode. <laughs> no, you haven't. You've learned I, I have a like cat. cat needs therapy. Learned. My cat needs a lot of therapy. <laughs> well, what's happened today then, Whiskers? Well, my owner, you know what I said about him blowing up my ass. Well, he, he keeps doing it, and he started oh, making notes, it. and now he's told his friends. It's really embarrassing. Yeah, she's concerned I'm going to stop doing it because you guys are teasing me. She's sat down so you can't access the area. <laughs> <laughs> If you could see right, her right okay. now, she'd just sat on the floor looking up at me like that. She's scared to stand up because you'll be down there like bloody honk. <laughs> like a, what is the, what's the instrument? Oh, Karina. Oh, oh, I can imagine you with different cat bun, bum holes. Like, do, 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 do. Yeah, if you got them all to stand on their like, front legs. And... <laughs> and, it, and the sphinx at the end's the high note. The... Like a Native no American fern. flute, but with cats. We've got a big Indian headdress on. <laughs> that would be great on the front page of the sun wouldn't it local man arrested <laughs> okay back to serious things yeah <laughs> while while we're on this just to deviate for a second then um something exciting I, i'm sure i sent it yeah sent to james well. top 10 animals to blow into their bum arms <laughs> number seven we've got the camel Num- number three, James's mum. Um... Yeah, you get a reaction. <laughs> Reminds me, I need to buy a, I need to buy her a razor for Christmas. Anyway, weed whacker. Oh. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> um. Oh god. What I was going to say is that Gareth Roberts, Mr. Gareth, who will be listening now, Ugh, that guy. who is a fan of the show so much that he personally Listens. messaged Emmanuel Bonamy, who who is, uh, for Emma, he is a guy that is a legend on our show. And Emmanuel Bonamy, from that message, started following Ragewell on social media. You need to give that a bit of explanation because... Yeah. Basically, I don't know how it came about. We mentioned some random French film on like one of the first episodes, and there was an actor called Emmanuel Bonamy, and for whatever reason, I thought his name was funny, so we kept bringing him up, and then we couldn't find anything about him, could we? Couldn't so find his date like of a, birth on IMDb or any other website. Yeah, we couldn't work out. So he came like kind of a myth, and we just brought him up. What did you say? Gave every show for the first few months. Yeah. <laughs> And then somehow like someone that. found him and he started following us, which is quite funny. Because we joked and said, the, min- the day he follows us is the day we finish all this. And he's already right. kind of backfired now. This is the last episode. Well, we need to get him on as a guest. So, Emmanuel, you if you're listening. He's French. So it's like, and also, if he, I hope sure he doesn't listen. I made quite a lot of French-related jokes, haven't I? Oh, I, I think, remember I the spider. Oh, look, Lispidia. Remember that? Big actor. He's, he's currently in pre-production of a film. Yeah, I think he's in Prague. It was Pierre and... Jean Luc or something on the oh quick get on the pesticule the speeders <laughs> hitting them with a baguette or something the most yeah. stereotypical it was, thing it was when Sting came out in the cinema and we realised he was in that other spider film but, but actually yeah. no it was really good but um, oh, up there. Gareth actually meshes message Bonamy directly sorry a bit too formal calling him Bonamy oh, yeah, you mess- no, wait, oh, and, and he's put Gareth has literally said 
I'm not sure if this link works or whether you'll have to copy and paste. But watch this episode at 41 minutes and 30 seconds. They start talking about you and it's quite funny. P.S. Exactly how old are you? Question mark. That's what Gareth sent to Bonamy. He didn't reply, but he followed us straight away. Wow. So maybe he did listen. We so, might not speak English. There he is. He's, he's following us there. There he is. He's popped up. I'm surprised this incognito man has Instagram and you found him. Yeah, like he's a proper French actor. He's been in tons of films and stuff. I mean, I've been stalking him thoroughly. Don't get me wrong. Kate um, wants him to be her boyfriend. That is yeah. a fact. <clears throat> I think he has. I've, he's got a girlfriend and maybe a kid from what I've seen, but it's fine. I can we can that. ruin that, don't worry. Yeah, I'll ruin that. I'll ruin that. Yeah, it's fine. We're meant to be, me and Emmanuel. One day, one day. If we get him on as a guest, I will message you so you can pop on the episode as well. <laughs> Never seen a more excited face in my life. <laughs> oh, Emmanuel. <sighs> anyway, to, and to go back to a bit of um, therapy, we mentioned it before we started recording. So excuse me if it sounds like we're repeating ourselves, but no, no one listened that heard it. Um, Didn't listen. Emma is Didn't going to be it. starting her own podcast, we hope. And um, what's the? what would you say is the main motivation and when are you starting? Is it just general chat about therapy or are you going to go into certain subjects and try and find people that can equate to those? Or are you just going to get random guests and see what you can do with them? Um, yeah, so I, I'm basically starting it because I have so many fascinating conversations. Um, I'm very active in Buddhist philosophy circles um, and obviously therapy circles and also with like different entrepreneurs. So um, yeah, I'm really keen and passionate about exploring like deeper meanings of life and how to live the best life you possibly can through both the inward journey and also how you interact with the world around you. Um, so I don't know when it's going to start, probably the next sort of three to six months. Um, and it's going to be sort of a format where I have a guest on, whether it's from Buddhist circles or other spiritual circles or therapy or business. And we're basically going to have deep chats about, yeah, about everything related to inner growth and just becoming the best version of yourself you possibly can. Um, so I'm really excited for that to start. Um, and yeah, once I do, I'd love to have you guys on as well and have more deep chats um, if you're open to that and kind of explore more of the arts and yeah, your passions around film. I think that's a really valuable thing to explore as well. Never even bloody talk about film on this thing anymore. <laughs> Actually, I listened to your episode this morning where you talked about the Joker thing. I did listen. Did I you? At least you do. James wasn't even on that one. That was just me and my. Why are you on at Michael. the end for like two minutes? Oh, you? Yeah. <laughs> That's a new thing. I don't even listen to him. Careful, how other people can put up with it. Say you don't like Lady Gaga, and then he came on in the end. The first thing he said was, "You don't like Lady Gaga." <laughs> yeah, yeah, because she ruins everything. Which I said before the Joker two came out, and everyone went, "Man, man, 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 man." What she do? She ruined it. Well, she didn't. <laughs> uh, Todd Phillips did all that. She started COVID as well. What? <laughs> Horrible thing, isn't she? Horrible. Uh, I can't lovely. stand her. I don't like her music. Her acting is terrible. Lady Gaga she's annoying. Great. I like Lady Gaga. She's a real person, James. You shouldn't be mean to real people. I'm not being mean, but she can't act. <laughs> well, have you acted in a film? Yeah, you have. Uh, no, yeah. that's why I'm not in a film. Um, what's the other film? No, it was Harbinger. Harbinger. <clears throat> and that one with where you got One Night in Milton Keynes. <laughs> Emmanuel that didn't Bonamy do so well. And me. <laughs> I'd like to see you on that. Emmanuel Bonamy and me. Me and Bonamy. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like touring the world like Jack White on his dad. Oh my God. Can I you love that me? show. Yes. I want to see you and Emmanuel doing that. I'm not that. a big fan of um, Jack White. What's his name? Jack? Whitehall. 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 But that show I do like because I like his dad. He's funny, isn't he? But, I um, love that relationship. It's hilarious. Yeah, and I hate the fact that he calls him daddy. It's so annoying and cringy. And <laughs> so that is a bit of a red flag. Upper upper class. Class. If I went out with a girl that said, oh, this is my daddy, I'd be like, fuck off. Imagine the other way around. Imagine a girl going out with a boy, a man, that goes, oh, daddy. He'd be like, animal. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Just that's disturbing. That's disturbing. Isn't what? that just like a culturally posh thing that they just call daddy? It's um, um, borderline. He might just be put on. To be fair, he might just be doing it for the show. To be fair to him. No, I think he's a comedian. He is a comedian. He wants it to be funny. Yeah, but he also does go, Daddy, where's mummy? Where's mummy at? Like, Ugh. I think he's mean mm, Bitty. <laughs> oh my God, that's going back. I don't think Emma's old enough to know what bitty means. Do you I know don't. what bitty means? Of to no. see. Do you know what that There's show, an old sketch show that. where, like, the, the little, kid little still breastfeed at like 35 and they'd be like in the shopping center. He'd be like, Bitty. And she'd be like, All right. <laughs> he's a fully grown man. <laughs> Uh, was that League of... Was that... Um, I thought that Britain. was... Um... Little Britain? Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, that wouldn't go down now. Oh. A lot None of Little, little Britain... Britain goes down well, because no. people are too sensitive. Well, yeah, and some of it is a you... bit OTT as well. Do you know, I started re-watching Inbetweeners the other day. Oh. I forgot how funny it was. It's Classic so brutal. funny. Emma, have you seen Inbetweeners? Um... Parts of it. I've seen the film, but not fully the series. Oh, the show's so much better. The than the film. It's on like Channel Four app. It's just, it's just great because you know it's exactly what boys are like at that age. That's why I don't want to watch. It. <laughs> yeah, horrible little cretins. <laughs> but that was that was like a seminal part of like our youth. That you was right in between us. Sorry, I drifted off from. Yeah, yeah thanks us. for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Some Actually, people, speaking of TV it, shows, so, wait a minute, wait a minute. Some people don't listen to our podcast. Kate's actually on the podcast and still not listening. <laughs> I explained that with ADHD. Okay, I might that's, have been somewhere else in my head. That's just okay. a quick one then, because I'm with with Eminent. Do you ever watch these like social experiment shows? Like I've, I'm a bit embarrassed to say, actually, but I've like I really like things like Married at First Sight and that that are like social I experiments. I love that show. It's interesting, and aren't they? The concept. The one on at the moment. It's just I think they put I think they put some people together for a wind up. If I'm honest, but like Love Is Blind is a good one where they met behind a glass door, and then it was purely yeah. on like no looks, no nothing. But I like that sort of stuff. I've, I mean, I, mm. I'm a bit sick. I kind of like it's Car Crash TV, though. but My... no, I would say it's probably not staged. Because it would be more entertaining if it was staged. Um, I think it's 95% legit. Mm. There obviously probably are some things that are thrown in there. So, like the questions they ask are a bit inflammatory and things. But I think it's kind of like they're yeah, pushed the, towards the, being the a bit dramatic. So probably what they're forced to say or do. or. But yeah, like I think that, the reactions are genuine. That Love is Blind, I don't think is a good show. But I, I don't watch that sort of stuff. But... It was a hack. Me and Sadie had a night out and we had a hangover day. And she put that on and she fell asleep. I didn't know she had fallen asleep. Watched three episodes and I was like, that was quite good. And she was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Kev put it on when what? she fell asleep. <laughs> it was good because it is that thing. It is literally individuals going into a room and every boy chatting to every girl behind closed doors and just getting to know each other and having a pad mm. and pen and asking like questions. big brother i can't deal with because it's everyone's just so fake and like for the cameras in there they're there they're, also like, yeah. with big they're not brother, genuine the cameras, like construe a load of stuff like they like put scenarios that make people like wound up and yeah, yeah. like they will bad clip together bits that make certain people look mm. good and bad like but ones like big brother and i don't i can't watch that because it is just really irritating people like genuinely irritating some of them and it's very much look at me for the camera whereas the other ones seem a bit more but genuine the, should we say but that married mm. at first sight sadie's watching that i've seen about maybe three or four episodes of the 10 that are out or whatever but i watched one of the series before about 16 now i think it, it was it, i thought it was interesting but like you say like they're putting they're meant to be experts that put a man or well a partner, a partner, um, together that they think will get on because of their not just physical looks, but emotional connection or background. And there's a couple that they have got so far wrong. You think, <laughs> are you taking the piss? Like, think they are with some of them. there's that there's that guy that loves himself. He's like a hairdresser or something. He's like he thinks he's cool as fuck, and he's just s slightly overweight chav, but he thinks he's the bee's knees. And he's he's like his thing is like oh he uh, 
beds loads of attractive women and the, the, the bride that walks down is slightly bigger than slim and he's like nah i can't connect and then they bring up in the first conversation but you slept together on the first night and he's like uh yeah because that's what i do but i've got no connection and it's like are you fucking serious this is horrible oh my gosh really it's a, horrible. It's a fascinating show isn't it because like i do i do agree that some of the couples maybe are like put together for good tv kind of thing um but i love it's it's directly the opposite to um love island isn't it it's like arranged marriage and it's like people need to get on and they have a what is it a weekly therapy session um with the experts and it's beautiful once you get through um the season a bit and then like the therapists are like holding them accountable for their like really shitty behavior. Um, and I just love it for that. It's like kind of more so a real setting where like it shows you marriage is hard. Like people coming together with another person is like, it's a really hard thing to do. And I find in general, like relationships are such a mirror for like all the growing and patience you need to grow within yourself. But that's such a good show. Some of it's like, like, like James said, it's, I think for comedy value as well. I don't think all of it's serious. Cause it's like, there's like, I remember a couple of series ago, again, I'd, I've not watched them all. I've watched bits and bobs of some of them. And there was one where it was a couple that got on really well. And it was one of those easy ones. It's like from day one, they connected, fancied each other. They were silly and they got their silly sort of humor together and they're fine. Everyone's got issues and bickering and they're the only two holding hands that are kind of like yeah we got this this is chilled and then like week 10 they're like right where do you live and where do you live and who's moving where and they live at the opposite ends of the country and one owns a farm so he's never leaving and the other one doesn't like people who farms because they're for animal they're not against animal cruelty and they're and they live with their fat they'll never leave their family who are the other side of the country and it's like well, what was the fucking point of those 10 weeks? It's just like you build it up, build it up, and then fucked at the end, you know? Yeah. And it's also like the the priorities. Like, I don't know. I guess it's really um, personal whether you would leave behind your family and what you have back at home to um, fall love, if you would move for love. Um, but, yeah, it's odd that they're matching people that don't live close. One minute. of them was quite funny because the woman was like, "Ah, oh, I sort of said someone that like you know I didn't want them to have kids." And then she got matched. She's like, "He's like, yeah, I got four kids." It's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that they really carefully matched the people so that they would get on. I they think they do. Because you're not going to just get like four random people that fall in love in a room. Like... But wouldn't you be wound up if you specifically said, "I, w- I don't want to meet anyone with like kids." And they put you someone with four kids. It's probably never going to want another one. And, and you're like, I think it's mm. difficult to connect everyone directly. But yeah, you're like you're saying that there's one that this, this series where this woman's got a kid, and the bloke's like, yeah, that's that's fine, but I don't like this. And he's like, a str- when I say a strong man, I don't mean a strong man in a positive way. He's like a dominating man, and they connect. They're like, they're like cool as fuck at the beginning. And then you realize the next day when she says something he doesn't like, he's like, tries to nip it in the bud. Like, I'm the fucking man. You do as you said. And she's like, wait, what? Mm. <laughs> we had a great night last night. And now you're saying I've got to keep quiet and I've got to na 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 na. Like, but, and then they go to the therapist, not therapist, the TV show man. And he goes, I put you together because you're strong and you're strong and together you'll be stronger. I'm like, that's a flaky way of like, seems like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Also that (laughs) not that you can't have two strong people in a relationship, but there's got to be strength in compromise as much as there is strength in actual communication or whatever. Do you find that one of like the biggest relationship killers is like a know-it-all or someone who is just like really stuck in their ways and not wanting to change? Or like, what's your view on like how much you should compromise in a relationship? (laughs) 
Oh, Stop Kate me. looks excited. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Go on. Uh, I just love talking about relationships. I'm like, oh, let's talk about this topic. Um, I think all relationships are compromised. Anything, family, friends, you've got to compromise to one expect. But I think the compromise you should never make is when you can't be yourself. Mm. Um, I think it's healthy to have different interests. I think that's fine. But if you have to compromise, like who you really are and change yourself, then it's not going to work. But if you compromise, like what film to watch or I don't know, what color paint for a wall, those are different ones. But I think, I think you've got to be willing to try new things, haven't you? Like if you, it sounds a bit of a stupid reason, but if someone like really like going to the football, for example, and on the flip side, the other partner really likes going to like shows. Like if you went into football, you go occasion. They wouldn't expect you to go every time. It's saying then if you if they weren't going to West End and you didn't like it, you still have to kind of even like stupid things like that are quite important because you're like, no, I'm not doing that. It's something you do with your friends. It's like, well, yeah, get your friends to go with you. But it'd be nice if you went like one time with that partner, even if it's not your. Yeah, something do you feel and far between. You, I think you've got to be able to do the things you don't want to do and still like find some enjoyment with them. I think there's a debate in the middle there. Like I completely agree with Kate in the sense that you've got to be yourself, but also are you not you personally, Kate? Just you as in all of us. Are you that great that you can better yourself? or change appropriately you know if i was the same person i was when i was 20 i wouldn't be with who i was with now and i wouldn't be the way i was now and i've had to change my personality and to a degree but not in a bad way not like oh i let that bit go and i feel pissed off it's like oh but i don't mean I've it grown like that there and i've grown there i mean it like if you, I don't know, have to change the way you make jokes or change the way you react to things or change your fundamental core beliefs. Stop seeing friends. 100%. Have to stop seeing yeah. friends as much. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I that's, think that's I agree a big with you. red flag. Yeah, yeah, and I think I agree with you to some extent, like, Kev, like, with relationships, when you're with someone for a long time, like, people naturally change and you're never going to be the same person when you're 20 as what you are when you're 30 or when you're 40. And I think it would be really bad if you were the same person because we should change, we should adapt, and life changes us. And I think with relationships, if you're with someone a long time, you either grow together and adapt to the fact you both changed and maybe both change in the same way or you change differently but it works, or you grow apart because you both change so differently. But I'm not saying that you shouldn't like change and better yourself. I'm just saying that if you have to... I don't know, behave in a way that's not fundamentally you if you have to, I don't know, if you can't just, I don't know, crack a joke that's your sense of humour and they don't get it or you have to, I don't know, behave more prim and proper because that's what they want. Yeah, like, that's if you not... can't relax and be yourself, then it's not healthy. I think. Mm -hmm. And, and I've been in relationships like that before where I had to, I felt like I had to be a certain way and it was really, really toxic and unhealthy. Um, and I've realised now that I would never put myself in that situation again, but I had to learn and grow from that. What but... did you feel like you had to be more prim and proper? And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so really? <laughs> because, no offence. Not, not that specifically, but... Um... But, but no offence, like, how can anyone want to date you and not love the madness? Oh, Do you know you. what I mean? And I mean that in the nicest way possible. Like, you're the way you are is the reason you would like you in any way, you know. Some I, people find that weird, you know? Some people are like... Well, no, you can't, you can't go... Like, some people will, but they're not the people for you. It's like, yeah, there's no right or wrong way to be. Yeah. Um, but it's being appreciated as you are for the person. And I, I, I'm hearing as well from what you're saying is like, so not being with someone who reinforces that you're not enough just the way you are. Right. That's what like, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can be weird, you know what I mean? And if not, someone's going to be like, why do you, for example, have. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> why do you have that? 
how many bags of skeletons do you have and any are any of them real because there is a red flag there at one point yeah this, this skeleton got turned into a lamb yeah and he's beautiful <laughs> i was this is a funny story completely unrelated um i accidentally i ordered this skeleton for halloween for my school um on the internet it's called colin colin mark ii and accidentally delivered it, talking of toxic relationships. I'm just going to be public. Delivered <laughs> it to my ex-boyfriend's house. Um, well, that seems a bit menacing, doesn't it? Yeah. But... <laughs> it was like, you know, when it's your old address, and then he was really arsy about it, like, oh, your package can stay out in the rain and all this stuff. And my friend was really sweet because he was around there, so he collected it for me. And I just thought, oh, my God, if he opened it, it would have got a little skeleton. <laughs> You should have told him to open it and tell him to oh fuck off. Oh my god! Open and he was just like, "Oh, it can stay out in the rain." And I didn't even remember what the package was. I was like, "What did I accidentally deliver to his house?" And then my friend went round to see him because his friends and was like, "Oh, I, I hope you don't mind," but he was just going to leave it out and picked it up. And I was like, "Oh my god, it's a giant skeleton!" <laughs> and then we were at a party for this friend's birthday on Saturday. I was like, "Can I just open it up?" So everyone was meeting the skeleton. But yeah, I mean things like that. If some people might find that unusual or a bit weird. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to assemble the skeleton. <laughs> Thank you. That's brilliant. Anyway, but... Talking about relationships again. <laughs> Back to relationships. Like, I think if you have to fund them, like, it's okay that you have to compromise. But I'm just going to carry on talking as I do this. If you have to find for the audio listeners, Kate is handling a skeleton and build putting the, the skull huge. on the head and adding an arm and his life don't size. look at his crotch this, and say it's this huge. Is what I need to deliver to my ex boyfriend's house this massive fucking skeleton. She's um, connecting the pelvis now. Yeah, thanks for um, yeah, but I mean, back to serious conversation. Me and me and Colin. Brilliant. Um, if you can't be yourself around someone like yeah compromise of course like like you know james made a good point like yeah you might be into football you might be into musicals you might have to you don't go every week to the football with them but you might have to go to one match or you might have to go to one musical and you might find your own interest but i think it's nice to compromise what I did with kev he had to come to the football with me and i went to watch music with him yeah, we, yeah. and we had a thriving relationship you were great I think something beautiful and like being with the person you love and seeing them be happy and enjoying the moment and just sharing that with them, even if you're not into the specific thing. But I have a question for, I don't, is Kev the only one in, in a long-term relationship out of all of us? Yeah, rub it in. Yeah. Excuse me, look. <laughs> so, it's really a couple. <laughs> um, I want to get your views or anyone's views over what the difference is between growing together with a partner and growing apart with a partner and what you think is the key to, um, yeah, to obviously everyone changes as we talked about. So how can you kind of stack the odds to whether you grow in a, in a parallel with, with your partner and not away from them? I don't think it's always growing. I think it's sometimes your, um, outlook and life changing should we say mm. like it, it depends on age because i use my example my last um relationship was about eight years which is quite a long time so basically pretty much nearly all her 20s and all my 30s and i think you just like between 20 and 30 and 30 and 40 i think those two time frames you change massively I think maybe some, I was maybe a time frame ahead, if that makes sense. Like, I was just coming into my end of my 30s. She was beginning of hers. And I think it's quite a big, um, I don't know, I don't think because you still like the same stuff. It's not like we started liking different things. It wasn't like at the beginning of a relationship, I really liked going out to gigs. And at the end of it, I didn't. And like like going to doing something else. And the same vice versa i don't think it's growing with hobbies and interests i think it's growing with like i think you should generally look on life yeah or look on yourself maybe yeah and you're um, i think and think you can butt heads i also think that over time you can just become like two friends like mm. sparks go out kind of thing 
Mm. And it's not necessarily anyone's fault. I think it can just. I don't think lockdown helped a lot of people. But do you, what think, lockdown, do you think age was a, a thing? Like maybe you were I think older lockdown took to away a lot of. Well, we had a lot of comfort blankets, so every couple of months we'd take a night away, go to Bournemouth, Southampton for the night without the kids, or we'd have friends around for games nights, go to families for barbecues, that sort of thing. And I think when lockdown come, you were kind of for at least six months, just kind of in a very, very small bubble without any of them comfort blankets. And you also pair that with waking up every day, looking at how many people had died, which everyone did, and then worrying about, you know, all the other stuff. And I think coming out of that, it was just like, that's a very hard thing to get past, like, especially when you've got two little ones as well. Because like you've got, then you've got zero time for yourselves. I mean, like I, none at all. Because we upheld the rules like to the T. We didn't visit anyone or anything like that. I think you can then you go into work mode almost at home. Like you come home, you're doing sorting out the kids, sorting out beds, sorting out the house, getting yourself sorted, going to bed, getting up, going to work. Because I went to work every day, so I think we both came out of that very different. But but James, aside of like take the I know that was a big factor, lockdown and COVID was a big factor in your relationship, but rewinding it back, how old was um her child when you met her? Three. Three. Okay. So obviously not gonna solve anything and it's not gonna be laying the blame here or there or whatever, but do you think a factor outside of knowing your relationship, do you think it could have been that she had a child when she was in her twenties and that's when you were, that's when people go out and experiment the most. And she probably was more of a homebody for like late twenties, early thirties. And you'd done all the madness and you're quite comfortably being chilled, but she felt that she was missing out and she wanted to go out when you wanted to go in. And that was, yeah, no, right. Kev, this is me. We're talking about the madness never ended. No, um, it did a bit. You got to admit, like when you get older, you can be less bothered with shit. No, she she likes going out. She still goes out now. Enjoys no, herself. You and saying, I still get a bit leery every now and again. No, but, you know, it, it wasn't that at all. No, because we we just had to adjust. It was more me adjusted than her, to be fair, to that. Because she was never like a going out real person. Enjoyed it, but it was never like oh, I want to go clubbing or anything like that. Was part of it like during lockdown? It sounds like you were so busy with things and adapting yeah, to the new lifestyle that you stopped prioritizing one another and yourselves and just there's just no about... time for it you know it was just constant mm. like constant work like you get home i get home at what six o'clock say feed the kids get them to bed for between seven eight half eight whatever then you kind of get your own dinner sorted by then you're looking at like nine half nine eight, ten o'clock you don't stick in something on netflix because you're knackered mm. and then it's like going to bed Whereas yeah, normally that would be the case, Monday to Friday, then you'd have the weekend to be like, oh, let's get our friends around, let's go around to our parents, let's have like where the kids are then occupied and you can then be more. I mean, it might not have been that, it might just be. I think some people just grow apart, to be fair. Mm. I think it's just life. Yeah, I was going to say it was, it was interesting for me also going through a, a, the end of a relationship during the lockdowns. Um, and meeting someone at work at the time, and I was like, "How how are you dealing with your partner in lockdown?" And this girl was like, "Lovely, we stay in. We've been like cooking nice meals. We've been watching loads of series. And like, it's the best time ever." And I was like, "Why you're not deeply scarred from like you know missing out on your friends and your family? Like, it was devastating for me during that time." But actually, I've heard of a lot of people that had a great, relaxing time when they... I think it's different when there's kids, because that very moment when lockdown started, my little one had learned to walk the week before. Mm. So a toddler needed 100% attention, plus like a nine, eight, eight or nine-year-old that needed 100% attention. It was just like chaos. Like, and I was at work, so I wasn't there. So just like constantly trying to keep your eyes on like two kids i imagine it was probably very difficult but um well it's different for everyone wasn't it but things even without lockdown still could have been the same outcome really but 
think we're both better for it now. So mm. look on the positives. You're gonna have to it's freaking me out a bit. So I am I am listening. <laughs> yeah, you got things things you gotta find the positives. I say this to people now that um have shit times. I'm like, for everything that's negative, there is a positive. Like life is like a battery. Just sometimes the positive things are hard to find. I think when you do find them, it kind of puts you a bit more at peace with the negative. You're like, that did happen, but if that didn't happen, this wouldn't have happened. So it's like, okay. Well. It's true. Every it sounds really cliche, but every negative thing that happens in life, something good has come from it. Even yeah, yeah. I think when you find that, you're like, oh, okay, you know. Just while James is chatting, Kate is ripping apart her um, skeleton. It got very weird. Sorry, I got really freaked out. I just thought, like, when you guys go, I'm going to be alone. Like, I don't know why. Like, I've lived with the skeleton before, which is also not normal. And there's obviously a mannequin in the other room that you already know about that looks really creepy. But she doesn't bother me. But I just kept seeing him in the back of the video. And I was like, oh, it's a bit scary. Actually. I don't want to be alone with him. I'm going to put him back in his bag. So, do you sniff him? Doesn't smell of anything. Give him a blow. <laughs> Kev style. <laughs> in the pockets. Uh, I th- Go I on, think guys, carry on. Don't mind me. I think as well with like relationships, I, th- I don't think there's any right or wrong because some, some people's relationships connect because there's so many similarities, whereas a lot of people connect because there's so many differences. Sometimes they complement each other. Like you could be a really like chaotic person and like really like vibe with a person who's really like, I don't know, goal orientated and stable and actually need that, you know? Yeah. I I think with, um, (coughs) excuse me, with, with Sadie, the reason I connected with her to begin with is that she was working in my place doing a different job. She would just do a weekend job. She had a, she had a, a week work. And then at the weekend, she earned quite a bit of money working in our office, just being the girl at the front desk, basically, who would take names and numbers for us to deal with later in the week. And we'd have to sit with her occasionally because she couldn't access the system. Anyway, I, I ended up spending a lot of time with her and opting to spend time with her because she always had something going on. Whereas most Good to see you doing your work, Kev. But, but, yeah, but most people didn't have things going on. They just existed. Whereas Sadie was I was always like, what are you up to? And she went, well, I've got this idea for a business. All right, okay, I'm in. I'm in. What is this? Next week I'd speak to her. She had a different idea for a different business. I'd be like, right, what are you doing with the last one? She went, oh, no, I've bettered it. Or I've done something else. Or I've started it and it's failed and I've done another one. <laughs> and she always had – she never stopped. She was always, like, scheming. She was like, you know – I don't know, just she was thriving on ideas and she was interesting enough. And even to today, it's been 12 years this December, I think, pretty much. And oh, poor girl. Still, Congratulations. still, she's scheming. She's still scheming. She's got ideas. Today, she came out with a new business idea she wanted to do. And I was like, half the time, I mean, I'm all, I always like it, but every now and again, I'm like, okay. <laughs> Is it? But she'll do it. It's not like I don't believe she won't do it. She does them. She just does them and gives them a go. If they don't work, they don't work. If they do, they they do. And um, I think the biggest thing with her is that she is brutally honest and severely offended if you don't believe her. If she says something, I take the piss. She's like, why would I say it? She's very matter of a fact, and that's um, I think a very good thing. In normal society, sometimes not a great thing. Like socially, socially, she will call someone out to their face and it's like, oh God. But when it's just me and her, like she just tells me what for. So I always know where I stand. Whereas I don't think that's true for most people. Everyone placates everyone to a degree. Everyone's got a bias to a degree. Whereas Sadie is black and white. There's no gray area. You know, so I think that's that's a positive. And we don't like a lot of the same things in a weird way. Like she came to one gig with me in Alexandra Palace. We went to see Jack White and we argued the whole time. F- fucking it was not a good experience. And I went, I'm never inviting you to a gig ever again. She Who went, doesn't oh. like Jack White? 
no, no, it's the experience of beach. She's not a fan of crowds and lots of people and big spaces. So that's why she hated London because she got a phobia. Basically, she hated London because she would be in the tube every day going to, she worked in Christie's auction house, which is just behind the Ritz by um, uh, Buckingham Palace. So she would get the tube every day to there. And I'd have a cushy job driving a little car around uh, North London, seeing the sights. I had a great time where she was miserable every day because of that. And from then on, she hates crowds. She hates buses. She hates public transport. She won't go to gigs, really. We went to um, Prodigy Gig, Alexandra Palace, literally about six months before Keith Flint uh, died. That was the last gig he did before he died. And it was amazing, but she couldn't cope with being in the crowd. She had to be at the very back. So we were at the back dancing. Um, but yeah, I think the differences, I think, is what works. That's my answer. I think not having too many things in common. Our humor is quite similar. She's quite brutal with her comedy. Um, some would say offensive. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's uh, not for public consumption half of the time. And it's and it's... It's it's great, but yeah, I think the differences are important. What would you say, Emma? Do you like? Do you prefer the differences or the similarities? Um. Well, I'm single, so clearly not, it's not. Uh, yeah, working. Um. But I think um, you don't have to be looking. You don't need a man. No, absolutely. I'm so happy single, and it's great <laughs> not having to worry about anyone and just. <laughs> Fixing also, on men, me. also, men are pricks. So pick. The also, least, I have a dog. So, like, what can a man leg? do? You got Is Mango still there? She's here. Pop her up. This is Mango. <laughs> oh. Is it's like a little teddy bear. Don't blow her butthole. She doesn't. Like I will that. not. <laughs> Good. She might like it. She's so cute. It might. It might increase your bond. Oh, no way. Can you? Can we just have her on the podcast? As long as she's, as long as she's up yeah, she's there. She's a therapy yeah. dog. Oh, she's so cute. Yeah, oh we God. volunteer together. Um, we've oh. been to a children's home for refugees, and they just cuddle her, and it's great. Oh, look at There's her. like a running joke that she's qualified as a therapist before me. <laughs> oh. Um, but yeah, so I can't answer your question. I don't know. I think it's really important for there to be like core things um, in common. So for me, it's like they need to have a deep passion to explore the meaning of things. Like I'm a deep thinker and I am very inquisitive about like why you are the way you are. Um, so they would need to have that in common. But I don't know about interests and hobbies. Maybe that could be whatever it is and as long as you have good communication with one another um and also similar attachment styles i seem to attract avoidant attached people who just like if there's an issue they need space and they don't talk about it i'm like no let's be mature let's talk through what's going on that's so rubbish. i think that's important how, how does everyone deal with issues do you just combat it i like to combat it to bury them deep down just erupt yeah. every Thursday. I just want <laughs> them to like blindside me one day, like years in the future, and I've buried them for a while. That's how I do. Are you really being being for real? No, I'm not being for real. No, I I'm I, asking... I am one of these people who just stands in front of the vehicle and takes it head on now. Kate, are you for real or a little bit? <laughs> oh, God. No, in relationships I like to communicate. Um Oh God, yeah. I'm Sometimes not you need to take like... half an hour or a day to calculate yeah. but get solve it sooner rather than later yeah your communication is king because once you know it one is... thing that winds me up and i'm not going to name any names but you know when you say to someone stupid things like this like grind my gears and i was like and it takes i don't really get annoyed because i can't be bothered but some things like grate me a bit and um <laughs> You know, let's say someone's stupid, like, you ever said to Sadie, what do you want for dinner? They're like, oh, you know, you choose. And you're like, okay, what about this? Oh, I don't want that. What about this? Oh, I don't want that. <laughs> like, what about this? No, I don't. Why don't you choose? And it's like, oh, I'll have anything. It's like, I've just literally fucking named like, three things. <laughs> just... Some people just need to say what they want. And they're buried in the garden right now, are they? No, they're caught. That's um, Colin. No, not <laughs> yet. Um, yeah, they're in the shed. Um, it's been raining. I don't want to dig. Is this them? 
have, no, because they're out there and they're some, they got their smell. Have, have you seen? They've the, not decomposed yet. In Switzerland, it's fine to kill people. That's have fine. you seen the horrible thing online about that? They're bringing that over that, here now, by the way. Have you heard that? What? What the suicide booth? No, oh, euthanasia. Right? Let's call it a nicer word. Yeah. There's talk about it coming to England. I'm just gonna go because my battery's dying. I'll be right back. Kate, she's ready to go kill someone now. <laughs> hide the body before the episode goes out. Have you seen that thing online about that woman who um, was caught with her parents' bodies in the house? Yes. Oh my word! Yeah, they've been there for four years. Four Did you years. See how nonchalant she was. She was, ah, oh, so you know, one up there. And just but... so you know, they're in the uh, fifth fifth wardrobe. Who has five wardrobes in a bedroom? Yeah. And... Imagine her going out at night, and someone's asked, "Should go back to yours?" She's like. Go back yours, maybe. Smells a bit corpsey at mine. Yeah, it must, it must have smelt awful. But it must have been horrific. The, the comment I found funniest when I, I looked at it, and the first comment at the top was like an American person clearly going, even when British people have been caught red handed at murder, they're so polite. Because she, <laughs> That's she's, true. Like, she's like, she oh, wasn't I don't like, want oh, you shit, I've been caught there, was she? She was like, oh, yeah, just you know, up there. She goes, I don't want you searching for days. Just if you look under the stairs in the bag. <laughs> find the hammer it's slightly rusty and there's a knife next to it there'll be my dna and their day dna and it'll save you loads of time and <laughs> they're like that's a real psychopath uh, that what? And she's just like yeah that's where the murder weapons are yeah my mum's up in the the wardrobe my dad's what in the garden or something i can't remember that's like dennis nielsen when he got caught he was like do you know what? it's probably good you caught me because i would have probably kept going but and it's like but this woman... But that's I, a sign of a true nutter, isn't it? I want to know more about this woman. What pushed her over the edge? That one comment, No remorse whatsoever. But one comment said, you know, maybe they deserved it. I'm like, yeah, what, what did they do? Well, to be fair... We don't know if they're abusive. Obviously no one does. I don't know, maybe... Uh, maybe she caught them blowing her cat's arsehole and she was like, that's enough. That's... <laughs> I've lost count of how many times... Sorry to go back to it, but I'm just... Processing the constant cat hole, bum hole blowing. There was about four bum hole. It's not often I ever no, no, get no. a chance hold to on, say. Hold on, hold on. There was four bum hole opportunities that I did not take, if you remember. <laughs> One of them you just smiled. I did and that. That's a soundbite on its own there, Kev. Just that. I had four bum hole opportunities <laughs> I didn't take. I might have that as my new ringtone. I've never seen such a strong theme throughout any one of your episodes. <laughs> it's just been start to finish cat bum holes. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, so to go back to James's earlier earlier question, if you all had to blow a bum hole, which animal would it be? Oh, I didn't ask that. What you, you alluded to? What would be your like an animal with really good buttocks? An owl. No, what? an animal with good buttocks. Yeah, yeah, like a horse. You want to blow something that's really hairy because you get too much. Of... <laughs> <laughs> you don't want clug nuts like little no, I... sheep are out. I think a hippo, but they're quite dangerous, aren't they? Mm, uh, yes, they're quite close, and they are quite yeah. dangerous. No, it's got it, the animal is friendly, even if it is like a crocodile. Does it a enjoy crocodile's it? friendly. If you blow it, bum hole. I or... don't think a crocodile has a bum hole. I think they just have cloacas, don't they? <laughs> they must have a bum. I'm hole. just thinking. I hope you get like a clip of me rethinking my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> what about a baboon? They've got it on display. <laughs> Wait a minute. This, you don't this, to be talking about which um, animal bum hole. <laughs> next therapy. time, I'm not coming back on. <laughs> Can you imagine Emma's next therapy session? She sits down with her clipboard. She's like, so, No, Stephen. I'm definitely the patient. She's like, okay, Stephen, so you, what, what animal bum hole would you blow first? Yeah, okay. It's mm -hmm. like a war shank test, mm -hmm. isn't it? What yeah. do you see here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't even like the ocarina. Imagine a snake. Be like, <laughs> Why would it be like hoo hoo? How long do you think it is? It's just like a little hole. It's not like a. So they got one. Hasn't got a letterbox. It's like a flute. If a, if you're blowing a snake, it's a flute. <laughs> like a harmonica or something. <laughs> Starts going up like that, like in Aladdin. <laughs> so Emma, you're not getting out of this question. Which animal? Would I you am. Be? I absolutely am. Pick an animal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Emma, can you ask us a serious question then to get us back on the because your last, I can recover from this. Your, your last podcast, <laughs> Help Help is Here, did not deviate like this. No. 
have a bit of deviation sometimes. It's it's the effect of us three, and we do apologise, but we don't apologise <laughs> at the same time. How long have all three of you been friends for? Eight weeks now. <laughs> I don't know, since 2003, four? Teenagers? Yeah. Oh, 1920-ish? So 20... I think I was about 18. O- over 20 years. Wow. Longer than some people I know that have been alive. Quite a long time. Do you say longer than some people you know that have been alive? We've been yeah, alive. A couple of my work <laughs> colleagues are like 19, 20. Oh. That's, that's Remember what... we, we had a colleague who was younger than me, and someone asked how old her parents were, because they were quite like cool, hip young parents. And I remember that moment where Kev was like, I'm older than your dad, and like you're a full like grown woman. <laughs> I know, but she caveated it with, oh, they're well old, they're 38-ish. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So yeah, we, we, we've all known each other a very long time. Well, we obviously dissipated at one point when you like early 30s and stuff and people move away and do different things, but we always kept in contact infrequently. But it's one of those things that I think certain people, when you have a friendship, it doesn't matter if you don't see them for a month or three years when you mm. together everything's cool and that's i think that's the true test of real friendships you don't have to see each other every day you know and we can you everyone's got different lives you know kate's in a bloody different continent where you are know? you kate i'm no, not in a different same continent. continent i'm in different europe country sorry i was in a different continent last week yeah i was in and brazil you, but i'm and now you, and you moved to a different continent you went to hong i did kong. i did move to hong kong at one point um, but I'm now in Switzerland, so that's not a different continent. <laughs> See, do you live there permanently? Yeah, I live in Zurich. So I'm a I'm a teacher there. A little so. tax dodger, aren't you? <laughs> no, I pay my taxes and it's very painful. Um no, I'm not dodging any tax. But yeah, Kate just upped and left and went to bloody Hong Kong. Boom. That's yeah, brave, I, that. I think. And now I'm in the Swiss cheese. <laughs> You and your little knives. <laughs> oh, can you send me one? Because I really want one. Yeah, if you want to, just let me know. I just did. <laughs> no, I, I really mean, want like, one. I need a dress. Like, I thought the other day, because I was doing something, I was like, do you know what would be really bloody handy? A Swiss army knife. I couldn't even tell you the last time I saw one in a shop. James, do you, do you know what really, else is really handy? Amazon? Yeah, but that's boring. I want one from Switzerland. Yeah, and they do have like special ones here with like you know that giant one they used to use like on the stand to advertisements about yeah. that big. Okay. For that backpack. I'm not sure if I can post that. <laughs> there might be some. Get noise. some tweezers. Has to have the tweezers, the you scissors, know what they have here, the screwdriver. Which is really funny. At the at the main train station, um, they have a vending machine for cheese. Which is funny. Brilliant. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I saw a vending machine for pizza a while back. I like that. Hot. When I was in Japan, mm. there was a vending machine for hats for cats, and I thought cats, well, yeah, like little little hats. For... Oh, hats for cats, yeah. not hats. Yeah, cats, I... not two different things. I bought one for my friend's cat. <laughs> Japan um... must have uh, Japan, China, Hong Kong, whatever must have the weirdest shit because they love. Japan a has machine. more weird shit than Hong Kong, but yeah. Um, back to serious conversations, guys. What should we talk about? Well, Emma wants to do a, well, we all want to do, and I'm curious about what it entails, of doing like a meditation. Oh, I like that. I think it could be a nice kind of um, check-in, a relaxing moment to go into the rest of the evening or the rest of the day for anyone listening who wants a little nervous system calmer. Um, could just be a sort of quick five minutes or so of meditation if you're up for it kev's not doing it though kev's would be like take a deep breath fixate on the bum hole in question and exhale (laughs) (laughs) okay i'm I'm relaxed emma and i'm serious i'll be relaxing me i need to go for a wee wee quick i also need one but i'll hold on so (laughs) (laughs) sorry emma let me ask, while we're waiting, have either of you um, come across meditation before? Have you ever tried it yourself? What's I, been do you know what? I, I need to ask you this as someone who has ADHD. 
Mm. Don't you find it hard with ADHD to meditate, like to quiet in your mind? Like, because for me, I try and meditate, and it's like my brain's like la 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 la, um, mm-hmm. and it's the hardest thing. I yeah. I struggle to meditate a lot. Yeah, sometimes it's harder than other times. I think even people with without ADHD have an incredibly busy mind, um, and I want it's important to address a big misconception of meditation is that the point isn't to have a calm mind with no thoughts. Like that's um, not necessarily the achievable idea of meditation because otherwise if your mind naturally has a lot of thoughts, you think you're not doing it right. So that's quite unhelpful to think that Um, the key or the, the amazing breakthroughs you can get in meditation is when you're relaxing centered and you notice thoughts coming up if you can notice oh I'm thinking let me go back to the breath that is a massive breakthrough because it's like you're watching tv and then you can realize oh I have the option of keep keeping watching this or going back to what I've remembered that I'm doing so a really key breakthrough is just being able to notice you have a thought so if and when that happens, because your mind will think, don't go into, oh, damn it, I've thought, I've, mm-hmm. I've, I've messed it up. Go into, oh, amazing, I've realized it, and I'm going to go back to the breath. Um, so that's something that's really helped me in my practice. Sounds good. Let's, shall, we, shall we give it a go? Because um, I, I did yoga for a while. I still do yoga at home. And that, at the end, you do a, you, you have a breathing peaceful moment mm-hmm. it's not quite meditation but it's a little bit like that like yeah. so much some i watch it on tv and i just follow what the person's doing and then mm-hmm. like you lie down for like a minute and you're like look up at the tv like is it still going on or like keep it going oh, it's like, <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't know what you're doing it just seems weird to be still because everything's so <clears throat> you always feel like you have to be moving so to be still is very Difficult, I think, yeah. for a lot of people. Do you do yeah. that Vikram yoga? Vikram, yeah, I do. I'm doing Vikram at the moment. Vikram hot yoga, which is in like a 39 degree room, um, but it's it's is challenging. It one of those air bubble things. Do they blow up? A no, thing that, like there a is tunnel? there is a company um, called Hot Pod Yoga, which is yeah. an inflatable dome, and they blast hot air in there. Um, but at the moment in Manchester, I'm going to a hot yoga studio but there's just heaters everywhere and it gets nice, nice I enjoyed yoga mm, you had wonderful. a ddp yoga that no, sounds that? unusual ddp stands for diamond dallas page um he was a former wrestler who um had chronic injuries with his back his like as you can imagine they get pretty bad injuries and um his yoga is a form of like body um treatment so he's had people that were like curved over at the spine like this whether it be through veterans or something and then he had this guy come on and he stood up he was like this before could barely walk he's like that and he's lifted his leg like up here like he's got these these previous athletes that could barely stand up now they're like fully posturized and it's crazy give it a google afterwards ddp yoga it's it's pretty crazy, especially for if you're trying to keep your body intact. I'm not sure "posturized" is a word, but um, "posturized" sounds too similar to "pasteurized." Fuck it, uh, whatever. <laughs> it slightly me. milky. Cool. O- okay. Over, over to Emma and the meditation. No mediation. Mm-hmm. Meditation. Meditation. Yeah. yeah. Not mediation, Kev. That's something different. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and just to preface this, we're not doing anything airy fairy. We are getting back in touch with our direct experience, not what our mind is fabricating and narrating. So that's all we're doing. Um, Okay, so the invitation is for you guys and anyone listening to sit as straight as you can. So not tensed but quite straight, like there is um, a cord at the top of your head. So just nice and relaxed, straight, or you can also do it lying down if you prefer. Um, But if you're sat, try and make sure that your feet are both touching the floor so you're nice and supported. 
Oh, I've got my legs crossed. I'm in full yoga. You can do that if you want, if you're if you're going to be comfortable. My my feet are on the ground. That, I'm grounded. Kate is Night, Kate. fully horizontal. I can only just see one eye. <laughs> you're Kate, good you can't say horizontal. something's fully horizontal and you can only see one eye. What do you mean? Oh. Okay. Oh, no. Those two both say reconnecting on my screen. Oh, no. I've still got him. We're all good. Kate's gone on mine. Kate there? Or was she frozen? She's got a real creepy face and I like she's in that film Smile. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know when we're ready. We'll wait. I can hear Kate. you. Oh, she's messaging me. Oops, laptop died. She's okay. gone. Car okay. Carry on without her. Okay. Yeah. She's gone, unfortunately. She did the creepy smile smile, and then her laptop died. She didn't notice. Hopefully she can watch her back and do it in yes. her own time. Okay. So, sat upright, your feet touching the floor, and your arms sort of just laying on your lap. And you can bring your eyes um, either to a soft gaze or close them as you're most comfortable. And we're going to just start taking a deep breath. So in and out. We'll do it once more. So breathe in through your nose. And out. Now I invite you to feel the ground under your feet. So you're feeling the bottom of your foot touching the floor. And if you're wearing socks, I want you to feel how the fabric feels around your feet or your shoes. And just see whether there's any tingling, if your feet feel cold at all, if they're warm. How are they feeling? And if there's any tension, can you release that? Then we're going to go up, in, up into our calves. Are your muscles tense? Are they relaxed? Your shins. Going to go up to our knees. And your thighs. Is there any tension? Can you feel the seat under your thighs, under your legs? Do you feel that your chair or your cushion is supporting you? How does that feel? going to feel our hips and come up into our tummy, your stomach. Are you holding any tension? Do you need to move at all? How is your stomach feeling? And can you release any tension in this area? going to go up into our diaphragm and our rib cage. Can you feel it moving as you breathe? You're just going to stay here for a moment. Just noticing how it moves with our breath. When you're ready, feel your heart space. So you might feel some tingling sensation if there is any anxiety or any feelings that inhabit the space. There might not be. You just feel in this area, is there any feeling of being rushed? Do you feel calm? 
How does this space feel? As you breathe in, can you feel that? And as you breathe out, can you release any tension and relax this space? So breathing in, feeling. Breathing out, releasing. You're going to go up into your shoulders. Again, do you need to adjust your shoulders, move them at all? Is there any tension? Can you relax all your muscles around your shoulders? We're going to go into our upper arms and your biceps and your triceps. Are you clinging onto anything here? Can we release it? We'll feel our elbows and our forearms. Go into the wrists and into your hands. Your hands might be touching on top of one another. What does that feel like with whatever your hands are against? It might be your lap. Is there any tingling sensation? Are your hands cold? Are they warm? What do your hands feel like? Now we're going to go back up into our throat area. Does this area feel expansive or does it feel quite tight? Can we relax any effort? Now we're going to feel our jaw. We can often spend a lot of our day with our jaw clenched. So do we need to move it at all? Can we release any tension in your jaw? Can I feel your cheeks? Feel your ears, which often get forgotten. How does it feel to have ears? Feel your nose. Feel your eyeballs, which can carry tension around them. Can we soften our eyes and any tension in our eyebrows? You might want to breathe in, feel, and breathe out. Release any tension in this area. Spend just a moment around your forehead. Are you relaxed here? Do you need to adjust? And the top of your head. How does that feel? Can you soften into the top of your head? Now I want us to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Feel your whole body as one from the tips of your toes to the top of your head. Feel yourself sat down however you are. Now we're quickly going to go over our senses. So I want you to listen for any sounds you can hear in the room. If you hear no sounds, how does that feel like? Can you hear anything far away? We're gonna to go to our eyes. So you might have your eyes closed or you might want to open them very slightly just so a bit of light comes in. But even if they're closed, do you see any shapes? Do you see any colour? What does it feel like to see? Now we're going to go to our nose and try and smell what the air in front of you smells like. What is it like to be able to smell? How does the air feel in your nostrils? 
Is it cold? Is it warm? Now go over to taste. What does your mouth taste like right now? What does it feel like to be able to taste? And finally, let's go to our hands. And once again, feel how it feels like to have one hand against the other, maybe, or on your lap. You might also be able to feel the weight of your clothes on your shoulders, or shoes on your feet, maybe, or socks on your feet. You can feel the seat beneath you. What does it feel like to be able to feel? Now I want you to just check in quickly in your heart space again. Does it feel buzzy? Do you feel calm? We'll take a deep breath in together. And the biggest breath you've taken all day. So all the way in. And breathe out. And slowly when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you for trying that, everyone. That was very nice. Thank you, Emma. I'm glad you came back, Kate. <laughs> I don't know what point you came back. My laptop died. Hmm. So I'm an hour ahead of you all, so I'm going to go to bed. So but thank you very much. It was lovely to meet you, Emma, and thank you for some lovely conversations and good luck with your podcast and when you get the name of it can you send it to us all so we can follow you i'd love to thank you kate it's so nice to chat with you and meet you lovely to meet you too nice to um, you. Right. bye Kat. bye james right. see you later when, when you were talking about parts of the body i could feel them i could feel them like it was mm. uh yeah magic interesting but yeah, I realised I spoke a minute ago and I was on mute because my cat kept meowing, so I, I muted it while you were talking. Mm. But I thought James had gone. He would. I thought he was frozen. He hadn't. He didn't move for so long. Well, I was behaving. I know you were. I didn't say you weren't, but I thought you'd frozen. I thought you'd gone. I'm very good at keeping still, Kevin. Yeah, I kept my eyes closed pretty much all the time, and then I just glanced up just to check everyone was there, and everyone was still there. Mm. That was lovely. So Had you done that... something like that before? Not like that. Have you, James? Mm. I've been doing it the whole podcast. <laughs> no, I have. What do you Sounds mean? I didn't really do anything for me. It does work, though, because my main vex is, is anxiety. Mm. So I do, like, triangle breathing, um, all the different types of breathing routine. I do them all day, every day. Like, because yeah. even now, like to put this in perspective, I've been what sat still doing nothing. And what's a reasonable heart rate? Sixty to seventy-five beats per minute. My current BPM is one hundred and twelve. Mm. From anxiety. Mm. So, this is what a day looks like with it. My range went from 191 to 131 today. And I've been pretty much sat down all day, doing mm. nothing. So, yeah, my current rest in today, I think, was 110. Mm. And do you find some respite from that, from more, like, holistic remedies, like breath work and, and stuff like that? Medication helps. But, um... Yeah, no, it's a, it's it's definitely it's a constant thing. You can feel it. It's exhausting as well. Because mm. you can be having one and not making a point of it. Like, 
I don't know, right now. But it is so tiring. Mm. See, I do them, what you were just doing now, I do all the time, just with my eyes open. Amazing. And you find that helps? It works. Yeah, oh, yeah, 100% works. 100%. Beautiful. It's almost just like not giving in to like the mind creating all the anxiety and just coming back to the present moment where we actually are. You know, we're not in the past or the future. We are just here and connecting through the body into our immediate experience can just quieten that voice for just a moment um, so we can be here. And it's, yeah, really nice practice. So I'm glad you do. Yeah, I've read loads about um, all that sort of stuff. Um, over the past couple of years, and it, no, it is like super. Like you, you, you must not triangle breathing. It's only you do a certain amount, a certain amount, a certain amount, and mm. that's quite cool. Um, yeah, and ga- 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 grounding yourself as well, like that, mm. helps sometimes. Mm. Like kind of like ground. Did you hear that one, Kev? No, not really. No. Like a lot of the time, if I'm sat there, I'll be sat with my hands like that. So it's mm. like connects. So you want your thumb and first finger make a triangle. Well, diamond. Yeah, so it's kind of like you connect in the uh, two energies kind of thing. Yeah. Which is quite um grounding at times. There are also some like pressure points in Chinese medicine. Like you can pinch between your first finger. Yeah, here, and here's a big one. Yeah. I and never f- really found they were that helpful, but um you do try. But it's like it goes it's, it's loads of little weird things as well. Like, you know, if people are uncomfortable um, with that, with their hands out of their pockets on camera or some board talking. If you just like touch your two fingers like that together, completely like takes the whole thing out. Well, I thought that was a fantastic episode. I really enjoyed that, and I hope people listening get something from it. And I'll share the full episode with you, Emma, so you can share it as well because. You can even use that if you want for one of your episodes, even though I know we go off the rails a little bit. <laughs> not be in, on your brand, um, but you can clip that out, do as you wish. And um, Thank you. Yeah, I, th- I thought that was great. And we always have, as I said, really good positive responses for having Em on the podcast. So, And Drew is pretty gutted. Like, I think he gets his internet finally. I think it's tomorrow, he said. So mm. he will be wanting you back because... Drew especially really loves this and this sort of stuff. So we'll get you back on again, hundred percent. And again, give us a shout if you want to chat to us individually. (laughs) Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks so much, Kev, and thanks, James. Yeah, it's a really nice conversation, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Good. Well, good night. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye bye. This has been Rage Whale. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope you had a whale of a time.